Dedication of An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by Thomas Reed. Dedication. An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by Thomas Reed, D.D. Professor of Moral Philosophy in the University of Glasgow. An inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Job. The Sixth Edition. Edinburgh. Printed for Bell and Bradfoot. And William Creech, Edinburgh. And for T. Cadwell and W. Davies, London. 1810. Printed by A. D. Neal and Company. Edinburgh. To the Right Honourable James, Earl of Findlater and Seafield, Chancellor of the University of Old Aberdeen. My Lord, though I apprehend that there are things new and of some importance in the following inquiry, it is not without timidity that I have consented to the publication of it. The subject has been canvassed by men of very great penetration and genius. For who does not acknowledge Descartes, Malebranche, Locke, Barclay, and Hume to be such? A view of the human understanding so different from that which they have exhibited will, no doubt, be condemned by many without examination, as proceeding from temerity and vanity. But I hope the candid and discerning few who are capable of attending to the operations of their own minds will weigh deliberately what is here advanced before they pass sentence upon it. To such I appeal as the only competent judges. If they disapprove, I am probably in the wrong, and shall be ready to change my opinion upon conviction. If they approve, the many will at last yield to their authority, as they always do. However contrary my notions are to those of the writers I have mentioned, their speculations have been of great use to me, and seem even to point out the road which I have taken and your lordship knows that the merit of useful discoveries is sometimes not more justly due to those that have hit upon them than to others who have ripened them and brought them to birth. I acknowledge, my lord, that I never thought of calling in question the principles commonly received with regard to the human understanding, until the Treatise of Human Nature was published in the year 1739. The ingenious author of that treatise, upon the principles of Locke, who was no skeptic, hath built a system of skepticism which leaves no ground to believe any one thing rather than its contrary. His reasoning appeared to me to be just. There was, therefore, a necessity to call in question the principles upon which it was founded, or to admit the conclusion. But can any ingenious mind admit this skeptical system without reluctance? I truly could not, my lord, for I am persuaded that absolute skepticism is not more destructive of the faith of a Christian than of the science of a philosopher, and of the prudence of a man of common understanding. I am persuaded that the unjust live by faith as well as the just, that, if all belief could be laid aside, piety, patriotism, friendship, parental affection, and private virtue would appear as ridiculous as knight errantry, and that the pursuits of pleasure, of ambition, and of avarice must be grounded upon belief as well as those that are honorable or virtuous. The day laborer toils at his work in the belief that he shall receive his wages at night, and if he had not this belief, he would not toil. We may venture to say that even the author of this skeptical system wrote it in the belief that it should be read and regarded. I hope he wrote it in that belief also, that it would be useful to mankind, and perhaps it may prove so at last. 
for I conceive the skeptical writer to be a set of men whose business it is to pick holes in the fabric of knowledge wherever it is weak and faulty. And when these places are properly repaired, the whole building becomes more firm and solid than it was formerly. For my own satisfaction, I entered into a serious examination of the principles upon which this skeptical system is built, and was not a little surprised to find that it leans with its whole weight upon a hypothesis which is ancient indeed, and hath been very generally received by philosophers, but of which I could find no solid proof. The hypothesis I mean is, that nothing is perceived but what is in the mind which perceives it, that we do not really perceive things that are external, but only certain images and pictures of them imprinted upon the mind, which are called impressions and ideas. If this be true, supposing certain impressions and ideas to exist in my mind, I cannot from their existence infer the existence of anything else. My impressions and ideas are the only existences of which I have any knowledge or conception. And they are such fleeting and transitory things that they can have no existence at all any longer than I am conscious of them. So that, upon this hypothesis, the whole universe about me bodies and spirits, sun, moon, stars and earth, friends and relations, all things without exception which I imagined to have a permanent existence, whether I thought of them or not, vanish at once. And, like the baseless fabric of a vision, leave not a track behind. I thought it unreasonable, my lord, upon the authority of philosophers, to admit a hypothesis which, in my opinion, overturns all philosophy, all religion and virtue, and all common sense, and, finding that all the systems concerning the human understanding which I was acquainted with were built upon this hypothesis, I resolved to inquire into this subject anew, without regard to any hypothesis. What I now humbly present to your lordship is the fruit of this inquiry, so far only as it regards the five senses, in which I claim no other merit than that of having given great attention to the operation of my own mind, and of having expressed with all the perspicuity I was able, what I conceive every man who gives the same attention will feel and perceive. The productions of imagination require a genius which soars above the common rank, but the treasures of knowledge are commonly buried deep, and may be reached by those drudges who can dig with labor and patience though they have not wings to fly. The experiments that were to be made in this investigation suited me, as they required no other expense but that of time and attention which I could bestow. The leisure of an academical life, disengaged from the pursuits of interest and ambition, the duty of my profession, which obliged me to give prelections on those subjects to the youth, and an early inclination to speculations of this kind, have enabled me, as I flatter myself, to give a more minute attention to the subject of this inquiry than has been given before. My thoughts upon this subject were a good many years ago put together in another form, for the use of my pupils, and afterwards were submitted to the judgment of a private philosophical society, of which I have the honor to be a member. A great part of this inquiry was honored even by your lordship's perusal, and the encouragement which you, my lord, and others, whose friendship is my boast, and whose judgment I reverenced, were pleased to give me, counterbalanced my timidity and diffidence, and determined me to offer it to the public. If it appears to your lordship to justify the common sense and reason of mankind against the skeptical subtleties which, in this age, have endeavored to put them out of countenance, if it appears to throw any new light upon one of the noblest parts of the divine workmanship, your lordship's respect for the arts and sciences, and your attention to everything which tends to the improvement of them, as well as to everything else that contributes to the felicity of her country, leave me no room to doubt of your favorable acceptance of this essay, as the fruit of my industry in a profession wherein I was accountable to your lordship and as a testimony of the great esteem and respect wherewith I have the honor to be, my lord, your lordship's most obliged and most devoted servant, Thomas Reed. End of Dedication 
Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut. Chapter 1 of An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by Thomas Reed. Chapter 1 Introduction Section 1 The Importance of the Subject and the Means of Prosecuting It The fabric of the human mind is curious and wonderful, as well as that of the human body. The faculties of the one are with no less wisdom adapted to their several ends than the organs of the other. Nay, it is reasonable to think that as the mind is a nobler work and of higher order than the body, even more of the wisdom and skill of the divine architect hath been employed in its structure. It is therefore a subject highly worthy of inquiry on its own account, but still more worthy on account of the extensive influence which the knowledge of it hath over every other branch of science. In the arts and sciences which have least connection with the mind, its faculties are the engines which we must employ, and the better we understand their nature and use, their defects and disorders, the more skillfully we shall apply them, and with the greater success. But in the noblest arts, the mind is also the subject upon which we operate. The painter, the poet, the actor, the orator, the moralist, and the statesman attempt to operate upon the mind in different ways, and for different ends and they succeed, according as they touch properly the strings of the human frame. Nor can their several arts ever stand on a solid foundation, or rise to the dignity of science until they are built on the principles of the human constitution. Wise men now agree, or ought to agree in this, that there is but one way to the knowledge of nature's works, the way of observation and experiment. By our constitution we have a strong propensity to trace particular facts and observations to general rules, and to apply such general rules to account for other effects, or to direct us in the production of them. This procedure of the understanding is familiar to every human creature in the common affairs of life, and it is the only one by which any real discovery in philosophy can be made. The man who first discovered that cold freezes water and that heat turns it into vapor, proceeded on the same general principle, and in the same method, by which Newton discovered the law of gravitation and the properties of light. His regular philosophandi are maxims of common sense, and are practiced every day in common life. And he who philosophizes by other rules, either concerning the material system or concerning the mind, mistakes his aim. Conjectures and theories are the creatures of men, and will always be found very unlike the creatures of God. If we would know the works of God, we must consult themselves with attention and humility, without daring to add anything of ours to what they declare. A just interpretation of nature is the only sound and orthodox philosophy. Whatever we add of our own is apocryphal and of no authority. All our curious theories of the formation of the earth of the generation of animals, of the origin of natural and moral evil, so far as they go beyond a just induction from facts, are vanity and folly, no less than the vortices of Descartes or the Achaeus of Paracelsus. Perhaps the philosophy of the mind hath been no less adulterated by theories than that of the material system. The theory of ideas is indeed very ancient, and hath been very universally received. But as neither of these titles can give it authenticity, they ought not to screen it from a free and candid examination, especially in this age, when it hath produced a system of scepticism that seems to triumph over all science, and even over the dictates of common sense. All that we know of the body is owing to anatomical dissection and observation, and it must be by an anatomy of the mind that we can discover its powers and principles. 
Section 2. The Impediments to Our Knowledge of the Mind. But it must be acknowledged that this kind of anatomy is much more difficult than the other, and therefore it needs not seem strange that mankind have made less progress in it. To attend accurately to the operation of our minds, and make them an object of thought, is no easy matter, even to the contemplative, and to the bulk of mankind is next to impossible. An anatomist who hath happy opportunity may have access to examine with his own eyes, and with equal accuracy, bodies of all different ages, sexes, and conditions, so that what is defective, obscure, or preternatural in one, may be discerned clearly, and in its most perfect state in another. But the anatomist of the mind cannot have the same advantage. It is his own mind only that he can examine with any degree of accuracy and distinctness. This is the only subject he can look into. He may, from outward signs, collect the operations of other minds. But these signs are, for the most part, ambiguous, and must be interpreted by what he perceives within himself. So that, if a philosopher could delineate to us, distinctly and methodically, all the operations of the thinking principle within him, which no man was ever able to do, this would be only the anatomy of one particular subject, which would be both deficient and erroneous, if applied to human nature in general. For a little reflection may satisfy us that the difference of minds is greater than that of any other beings which we consider of the same species. Of the various powers and faculties we possess, there are some which nature seems both to have planted and reared so as to have left nothing to human industry. Such are the powers which we have in common with the brutes, and which are necessary to the preservation of the individual, or the continuance of the kind. There are other powers, of which nature hath only planted the seeds in our minds, but hath left the rearing of them to human culture. It is by the proper culture of these that we are capable of all those improvements in intellectuals, in taste, and in morals, which exalt and dignify human nature, while on the other hand, the neglect or perversion of them makes its degeneracy and corruption. The two-legged animal, that eats of nature's dainties, what his taste or appetite craves, and satisfies his thirst at the crystal fountain, who propagates his kind as occasion and lust prompt, repels injuries, and takes alternate labor and repose, is, like a tree in the forest, purely of nature's growth. But this same savage hath within him the seeds of the logician, the man of taste and breeding, the orator, the statesman, the man of virtue, and the saint, which seeds, though planted in his mind by nature, yet through want of culture and exercise, must lie for ever buried, and be hardly perceivable by himself or by others. The lowest degree of social life will bring to light some of those principles which lay hid in the savage state, and according to his training, and company, and manner of life, some of them, either by their native vigor, or by the force of culture, will thrive and grow up to great perfection. Others will be strangely perverted from their natural form, and others checked or perhaps quite eradicated. This makes human nature so various and multiform in the individuals that partake of it, that, in point of morals and intellectual endowments, it fills up all that gap which we conceive to be between brutes and devils below, and the celestial orders above and such a prodigious diversity of minds must make it extremely difficult to discover the common principles of the species. The language of philosophers, with regard to the original faculties of the mind, is so adapted to the prevailing system that it cannot fit any other, like a coat that fits the man for whom it was made, and shows him to advantage, which yet will sit very awkward upon one of a different make, although perhaps as handsome and as well proportioned. It is hardly possible to make any innovation in our philosophy concerning the mind and its operations without using new words and phrases, or giving a different meaning to those that are received, a liberty which even when necessary creates prejudice and misconstruction, and which must wait the sanction of time to authorize it. 
for innovations in language, like those in religion and government, are always suspected and disliked by the many, till use hath made them familiar and prescription hath given them a title. If the original perceptions and notions of the mind were to make their appearance single and unmixed as we first perceived them from the hand of nature, one accustomed to reflection would have less difficulty in tracing them. But before we are capable of reflection, they are so mixed, compounded and decompounded by habits, associations, and abstractions, that it is hard to know what they were originally. The mind may, in this respect, be compared to an apothecary or a chemist, whose materials indeed are furnished by nature, but for the purposes of his art he mixes, compounds, dissolves, evaporates, and sublimes them, till they put on a quite different appearance, so that it is very difficult to know what they were at first, and much more to bring them back to their original and natural form. And this work of the mind is not carried on by deliberate acts of mature reason, which we might recollect, but by means of instincts, habits, associations, and other principles, which operate before we come to the use of reason, so that it is extremely difficult for the mind to return upon its own footsteps and trace back those operations which have employed it since it first began to think and act. Could we obtain a distinct and full history of all that hath passed in the mind of a child, from the beginning of life and sensation, till it grows up to the use of reason, how its infant faculties began to work, and how they brought forth and ripened all the various notions, opinions, and sentiments which we find in ourselves when we come to be capable of reflection, this would be a treasure of natural history, which would probably give more light into the human faculties than all the systems of philosophers about them since the beginning of the world. But it is in vain to wish for what nature has not put within the reach of our power. Reflection, the only instrument by which we can discern the powers of the mind, comes too late to observe the progress of nature in raising them from their infancy to perfection. It must, therefore, require great caution and great application of mind for a man that is grown up in all the prejudices of education, fashion, and philosophy, to unravel his notions and opinions, till he finds out the simple and original principle of his constitution, of which no account can be given but the will of our Maker. This may be truly called an analysis of the human faculties, and till this is performed, it is in vain we expect any just system of the mind, that is, an enumeration of the original powers and laws of our constitution, and an explication from them of the various phenomena of human nature. Success in an inquiry of this kind it is not in human power to command, but perhaps it is possible by caution and humility to avoid error and delusion. The labyrinth may be too intricate, and the thread too fine to be traced through all its windings, but if we stop where we can trace it no further, and secure the ground we have gained there, there is no harm done. A quicker eye may in time trace it further. It is genius, and not want of it, that adulterates philosophy, and fills it with error and false theory. A creative imagination disdains the mean offices of digging for a foundation, of removing rubbish and carrying material, leaving these servile employments to the drudges in science, it plans a design and raises a fabric. Invention supplies materials where they are wanting, and fancy adds coloring and every befitting ornament. The work pleases the eye and wants nothing but solidity and a good foundation. It seems even to vie with the works of nature, till some succeeding architect blows it into rubbish and builds a goodly fabric of his own in its place. Happily for the present age, the castle builders employ themselves more in romance than in philosophy. That is undoubtedly their province, and in those regions the offspring of fancy is legitimate. But in philosophy it is spurious. Section 3. The Present State of This Part of Philosophy of Descartes, Malebranc, and Locke that our philosophy concerning the mind and its faculties is but in a very low state may be reasonably conjectured even by those who never have narrowly examined it 
are there any principles with regard to the mind settled with that perspicuity and evidence which attends the principles of mechanics astronomy and optics these are really sciences built upon laws of nature which universally obtain what is discovered in them is no longer a matter of dispute future ages may add to it but till the course of nature be changed what is already established can never be overturned but when we turn our attention inward and consider the phenomena of human thoughts opinions and perceptions and endeavor to trace them to the general laws and the first principles of our constitution we are immediately involved in darkness and perplexity and if common sense or the principles of education happen not to be stubborn it is odds but we end in absolute scepticism descartes finding nothing established in this part of philosophy in order to lay the foundation of it deep resolved not to believe in his own existence till he should be able to give a good reason for it he was perhaps the first that took up such a resolution but if he could indeed have effected his purpose and really become diffident of his existence his case would have been deplorable and without any remedy from reason or philosophy a man that disbelieves his own existence is surely as unfit to be reasoned with as a man that believes he is made of glass there may be disorders in the human frame that may produce such extravagancies but they will never be cured by reasoning descartes indeed would make us believe that he got out of this delirium by his logical argument cogito ergo sum but it is evident he was in his senses all the time and never seriously doubted of his existence for he takes it for granted in this argument and proves nothing at all i am thinking says he therefore i am and is it not as good reasoning to say i am sleeping therefore i am or i am doing nothing therefore i am if a body moves it must exist no doubt but if it is at rest it must exist likewise perhaps descartes meant not to assume his own existence in this enthymeme but the existence of thought and to infer from that the existence of a mind or subject of thought but why did he not prove the existence of his thought consciousness it may be said vouches that but who is voucher for consciousness can any man prove that his consciousness may not deceive him no man can nor can we give a better reason for trusting to it than that every man while his mind is sound is determined by the constitution of his nature to give implicit belief to it and to laugh at or pity the man who doubts its testimony and is not every man in his wits as much determined to take his existence upon trust as his consciousness the other proposition assumed in this argument that thought cannot be without a mind or subject is liable to the same objection not that it wants evidence but that its evidence is no clearer nor more immediate than that of the proposition to be proved by it and taking all these propositions together i think i am conscious everything that thinks exists i exist would not every sober man form the same opinion of the man who seriously doubted any one of them and if he was his friend would he not hope for his cure from psychic and good regimen rather than from metaphysic and logic but supposing it proved that my thought and my consciousness must have a subject and consequently that i exist how do i know that all that train and succession of thoughts which i remember belong to one subject and that i of this moment is the very individual i of yesterday and of times past descartes did not think it proper to start this doubt but locke has done it and in order to resolve it gravely determines that personal identity consists in consciousness that is if you are conscious that you did such a thing twelve months ago this consciousness makes you to be the very person that did it now consciousness of what is past can signify nothing else but the remembrance that i did it so that locke's principle must be that identity consists in remembrance and consequently a man must lose his personal identity with regard to everything he forgets 
nor are these the only instances whereby our philosophy concerning the mind appears to be very fruitful in creating doubts, but very unhappy in resolving them. Descartes, Malebranc, and Locke have all employed their genius and skill to prove the existence of a material world, and with very bad success. Poor untaught mortals believe undoubtedly that there is a sun, moon, and stars, an earth which we inhabit, country, friends, and relations which we enjoy, land, houses, and movables which we possess. But philosophers, pitying the credulity of the vulgar, resolve to have no faith but what is founded upon reason. They apply to philosophy to furnish them with reason for the belief of those things which all mankind have believed without being able to give any reason for it. And surely one would expect that in matters of such importance the proof would not be difficult. But it is the most difficult thing in the world. For these three great men, with the best good will, have not been able from all the treasures of philosophy to draw one argument that is fit to convince a man that can reason of the existence of any one thing without him. Admired philosophy, daughter of light, parent of wisdom and knowledge, if thou art she, surely thou hast not yet arisen upon the human mind, nor blessed us with more of thy rays than are sufficient to shed a darkness visible upon the human faculties, and to disturb that repose and security which happier mortals enjoy, who never approached thine altar, nor felt thine influence. But if indeed thou hast not power to dispel those clouds and phantoms which thou hast discovered, or created, withdraw this penurious and malignant ray, I despise philosophy, and renounce its guidance. Let my soul dwell with common sense. Section 4 Apology for Those Philosophers But instead of despising the dawn of light, we ought rather to hope for its increase. Instead of blaming the philosophers I have mentioned for the defects and blemishes of their system, we ought rather to honor their memories as the first discoveries of a region in philosophy formerly unknown. And, however lame and imperfect the system may be, they have opened the way to future discoveries, and are justly entitled to a great share in the merit of them. They have removed an infinite deal of rust and rubbish collected in the ages of scholastic sophistry which had obstructed the way. They have put us in the right road, that of experience and accurate reflection. They have taught us to avoid the snares of ambiguous and ill-defined words, and have spoken and thought upon this subject with a distinctness and perspicuity formerly unknown. They have made many openings that may lead to the discovery of truths which they did not reach, or to the destruction of errors in which they were involuntarily entangled. It may be observed that the defects and blemishes in the received philosophy concerning the mind, which have most exposed it to the contempt and ridicule of sensible men, have chiefly been owing to this, that the votaries of this philosophy, from a natural prejudice in her favor, have endeavored to extend her jurisdiction beyond its just limits, and to call to her bar the dictates of common sense. But these decline this jurisdiction, they disdain the trial of reasoning, and disown its authority. They neither claim its aid nor dread its attacks. In this unequal contest betwixt common sense and philosophy, the latter will always come off both with dishonor and loss. Nor can she ever thrive till this rivalship is dropped, these encroachments given up, and a cordial friendship restored. For, in reality, common sense holds nothing of philosophy, nor needs her aid. But on the other hand, philosophy, if I may be permitted to change the metaphor, has no other root but the principles of common sense. It grows out of them, and draws its nourishment from them. Severed from this root, its honors wither, its sap is dried up, it dies and rots. The philosophers of the last age, whom I have mentioned, did not attend to the preserving this union and subordination so carefully as the honor and interest of philosophy required. But those of the present have waged open war with common sense, 
and hope to make a complete conquest of it by the subtleties of philosophy. An attempt no less audacious and vain than that of the giants to dethrone almighty Jove. Section 5 of Bishop Berkeley, The Treatise of Human Nature, and of Skepticism. The present age, I apprehend, has not produced two more acute or more practice in this part of philosophy than the Bishop of Cloyne and the author of the Treatise of Human Nature. The first was no friend to skepticism, but had that warm concern for religious and moral principles which became his order. Yet the result of his inquiry was a serious conviction that there is no such thing as a material world, nothing in nature but spirits and ideas, and that the belief of material substances and of abstract ideas are the chief causes of all our errors in philosophy, and of all infidelity and heresy and religion. His arguments are founded upon the principles which were formerly laid down by Descartes, Malebranche, and Locke, and which have been very generally received. And the opinion of the ablest judges seems to be that they neither have been nor can be confuted and that he hath proved by unanswerable arguments what no man in his senses can believe. The second proceeds upon the same principles, but carries them to their full length, and as the bishop undid the whole material world, this author, upon the same grounds, undoes the world of spirits, and leaves nothing in nature but ideas and impressions, without any subject on which they may be impressed. It seems to be a peculiar strain of humor in this author to set out in his introduction by promising with a grave face no less than a complete system of the sciences upon a foundation entirely new to wit that of human nature when the intention of the whole work is to show that there is neither human nature nor science in the world it may perhaps be unreasonable to complain of this conduct in an author who neither believes his own existence, nor that of his reader, and therefore could not mean to disappoint him, or to laugh at his credulity. Yet I cannot imagine that the author of the Treatise of Human Nature is so skeptical as to plead this apology. He believed against his principles that he should be read, and that he should retain his personal identity till he reaped the honor and reputation justly due to his metaphysical acumen. Indeed, he ingeniously acknowledges that it was only in solitude and retirement that he could yield any assent to his own philosophy. Society, like daylight, dispelled the darkness and fogs of skepticism, and made him yield to the dominion of common sense. Nor did I ever hear him charged with the doing anything, even in solitude, that argued such a degree of skepticism as his principles maintain. Surely, if his friends apprehended this, they would have the charity never to leave him alone. Pyro, the Ilian, the father of this philosophy, seems to have carried it to greater perfection than any of his successors. For if we may believe Antigonus, the Carsatian, quoted by a Diogenes Laertius, his life corresponded to his doctrine. And therefore, if a cart run against him, or a dog attacked him, or if he came upon a precipice, he would not stir a foot to avoid the danger, giving no credit to his senses. But his attendants, who, happily for him, were not so great skeptics, took care to keep him out of harm's way, so that he lived till he was ninety years of age. Nor is it to be doubted that this author's friends would have been equally careful to keep him from harm, if ever his principles had taken too strong a hold of him. It is probable the treatise of human nature was not written in company. Yet it contains manifest indications that the author every now and then relapsed into the faith of the vulgar, and could hardly for half a dozen pages keep up the skeptical character. In like manner, the great Pyro himself forgot his principles on some occasions, and is said once to have been in such a passion with his cook, who probably had not roasted his dinner to his mind, that with the spit in his hand and the meat upon it, he pursued him even into the marketplace. It is a bold philosophy that rejects without ceremony principles which irresistibly govern the belief 
and the conduct of all mankind in the common concerns of life, and to which the philosopher himself must yield, after he imagines he hath confuted them. Such principles are older and of more authority than philosophy. She rests upon them as her basis, not they upon her. If she could overturn them, she must be buried in their ruins. But all the engines of philosophical subtlety are too weak for this purpose, and the attempt is no less ridiculous than if a mechanic should contrive an axis in peritrochio to remove the earth out of its place, or if a mathematician should pretend to demonstrate that things equal to the same thing are not equal to one another. Zeno endeavored to demonstrate the impossibility of motion, Hobbes that there was no difference between right and wrong, and this author that no credit is to be given to our senses, to our memory, or even to demonstration. Such philosophy is justly ridiculous, even to those who cannot detect the fallacy of it. It can have no other tendency than to show the acuteness of the sophist at the expense of disgracing reason and human nature, and making mankind yahoos. Section 6 of the Treatise of Human Nature There are other prejudices against this system of human nature, which even upon general view may make one diffident of it. Descartes, Hobbes, and this author have each of them given us a system of human nature, an undertaking too vast for any one man, how great soever his genius and abilities may be. There must surely be reason to apprehend that many parts of human nature never came under their observation, and that others had been stretched and distorted to fill up blanks and complete the system. Christopher Columbus, or Sebastian Cabot, might almost as reasonably have undertaken to give us a complete map of America. There is a certain character and style in nature's works which is never attained in the most perfect imitation of them. This seems to be wanting in the systems of human nature I have mentioned, and particularly in the last. One may see a puppet make a variety of motions and gesticulations which strike much at first view, but when it is accurately observed and taken to pieces, our admiration ceases. We comprehend the whole art of the maker. How unlike is it to that which it represents? What a poor piece of work compared with the body of a man, whose structure the more we know, the more wonders we discover in it, and the more sensible we are of our ignorance. Is the mechanism of the mind so easily comprehended when that of the body is so difficult? Yet, by this system, three laws of association, joined to a few original feelings, explain the whole mechanism of sense, imagination, memory, belief, and of all the actions and passions of the mind. Is this the man that nature made? I suspect it is not so easy to look behind the scenes in nature's work. This is a puppet, surely, contrived by too bold an apprentice of nature to mimic her work. It shows tolerably by candlelight, but, brought into clear day, and taken to pieces, it will appear to be a man made with mortar and a trowel. The more we know of other parts of nature, the more we like and approve them. The little I know of the planetary system, of the earth which we inhabit, of minerals, vegetables, and animals, of my own body, and of the laws which obtain in these parts of nature, opens to my mind grand and beautiful scenes, and contributes equally to my happiness and power. But when I look within, and consider the mind itself, which makes me capable of all of these prospects and enjoyments, if it is indeed what the treatise of human nature makes it, I find I have been only in an enchanted castle, imposed upon by spectres and apparitions. I blush inwardly to think how I have been deluded. I am ashamed of my frame and can hardly forbear expostulating with my destiny. Is this thy pastime, O nature, to put such tricks upon a silly creature, and then to take off the mask and show him how he hath been befooled? If this is the philosophy of human nature, my soul enter thou not into these secrets. It is surely the forbidden tree of knowledge. I no sooner taste of it than I perceive myself naked, and stripped of all things, yea, even of my very self. I see myself and the whole frame of nature shrink into fleeting ideas, which, like Epicurus's atoms, dance about in emptiness. 
Section 7. The system of all these authors is the same, and leads to skepticism. But what if these profound disquisitions into the first principles of human nature do naturally and necessarily plunge a man into this abyss of skepticism? May we not reasonably judge so from what hath happened? Descartes no sooner began to dig in this mine than skepticism was ready to break in upon him. He did what he could to shut it out. Malebranche and Locke, who dug deeper, found the difficulty of keeping out this enemy still to increase, but they labored honestly in the design. Then Barclay, who carried on the work, despairing of securing all, bethought himself of an expedient. By giving up the material world, which he thought might be spared without loss, and even with advantage, he hoped by an impregnable partition to secure the world of spirits. But alas, the treatise of human nature wantonly sapped the foundation of this partition, and drowned all in one universal deluge. These facts, which are undeniable, do indeed give reason to apprehend that Descartes' system of the human understanding, which I shall beg leave to call the ideal system, and which with some improvements made by later writers is now generally received, hath some original defect, that this skepticism is inlaid in it, and reared along with it, and therefore that we must lay it open to the foundation, and examine the materials before we can expect to raise any solid and useful fabric of knowledge on this subject. Section 8. We ought not to despair of a better. But is this to be despaired of, because Descartes and his followers have failed? By no means. This pusillanimity would be injurious to ourselves, and injurious to truth. Useful discoveries are sometimes indeed the effect of superior genius, but more frequently they are the birth of time and of accidents. A traveller of good judgment may mistake his way, and be unawares led into a wrong track, and while the road is fair before him he may go on without suspicion, and be followed by others. But when it ends in a coal-pit, it requires no great judgment to know that he hath gone wrong, nor perhaps to find out what misled him. In the meantime, the unprosperous state of this part of philosophy hath produced an effect somewhat discouraging indeed to any attempt of this nature, but an effect which might be expected, and which time only and better success can remedy. Sensible men, who never will be skeptics in matters of common life, are apt to treat with sovereign contempt everything that hath been said or is to be said upon this subject. It is metaphysics, say they, who minds it? Let scholastic sophisters entangle themselves in their own cobwebs. I am resolved to take my own existence, and the existence of other things, upon trust, and to believe that snow is cold, and honey sweet whatever they may say to the contrary. He must either be a fool or want to make a fool of me. That would reason me out of my reason and senses. I confess I know not what a skeptic can answer to this, nor by what good argument he can plead even for a hearing. For either his reasoning is sophistry, and so deserves contempt, or there is no truth in the human faculties, and then why should we reason? If therefore a man find himself entangled in these metaphysical toils, and can find no other way to escape, let him bravely cut the knot which he cannot loose, curse metaphysic, and dissuade every man from meddling with it. For if I have been led into bogs and quagmires by following an ignis fatuus, what can I better do than warn others to beware of it? If philosophy contradicts herself, befools her votaries, and deprives them of every object worthy to be pursued or enjoyed, let her be sent back to the infernal regions from which she must have had her original. But has it absolutely certain that this fair lady is of the party? Is it not possible she may have been misrepresented? Have not men of genius in former ages often made their own dreams to pass for her oracles? Ought she then to be condemned without any further hearing? This would be unreasonable. I have found her in all other matters an agreeable companion, a faithful counsellor, a friend to common sense, and to the happiness of mankind. This justly entitles her to my correspondence and confidence, 
till I find infallible proofs of her infidelity. End of chapter 1 Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut Chapter 2 of An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by Thomas Reed Chapter 2 Of Smelling Section 1 The Order of Proceeding Of the Medium and Organ of Smell It is so difficult to unravel the operations of the human understanding, and to reduce them to their first principles, that we cannot expect to succeed in the attempt, but by beginning with the simplest, and proceeding by very cautious steps to the more complex. The five external senses may, for this reason, claim to be the first considered in an analysis of the human faculties, and the same reason ought to determine us to make a choice even among the senses, and to give the precedence not to the noblest, or most useful, but to the simplest, and that whose objects are least in danger of being mistaken for other things. In this view, an analysis of our sensations may be carried on perhaps with most ease and distinctness, by taking them in this order, smelling, tasting, hearing, touch, and last of all, seeing. Natural philosophy informs us that all animal and vegetable bodies, and probably all or most other bodies, while exposed to the air, are continually sending forth effluvia of vast subtlety, not only in their state of life and growth, but in the states of fermentation and putrefaction. These volatile particles do probably repel each other, and so scatter themselves in the air, until they meet with other bodies, to which they have some chemical affinity, and with which they unite and form new concretes. All the smell of plants and of other bodies is caused by these volatile parts, and is smelled wherever they are scattered in the air and the acuteness of smell in some animals shows us that these effluvia spread far and must be inconceivably subtle. Whether, as some chemists conceive, every species of bodies hath a spiritus rectus, a kind of soul which causes the smell, and all the specific virtues of that body, and which being extremely volatile flies about in the air in quest of a proper receptacle, I do not inquire. This, like most other theories, is perhaps rather the product of imagination than of just induction. But that all bodies are smelled by means of effluvia, which they emit, and which are drawn into the nostrils along with the air, there is no reason to doubt, so that there is manifest appearance of design in placing the organ of smell in the inside of that canal, through which the air is continually passing in inspiration and expiration. Anatomy informs us that the membrana pituitaria and the olfactory nerves which are distributed to the villous parts of this membrane are the organs destined by the wisdom of nature to this sense, so that when a body emits no effluvia, or when they do not enter into the nose, or when the pituitary membrane or olfactory nerves are rendered unfit to perform their office, it cannot be smelled. Yet, notwithstanding this, it is evident that neither the organ of smell, nor the medium, nor any motions we can conceive, excited in the membrane above mentioned, or in the nerve or animal spirits, do in the least resemble the sensation of smelling. Nor could that of sensation of itself ever have led us to think of nerves, animal spirits, or effluvia. Section 2. The Sensation Considered Abstractly Having premised these things with regard to the medium and organ of this sense, let us now attend carefully to what the mind is conscious of when we smell a rose or a lily. 
and since our language affords no other name for this sensation, we shall call it a smell or odor. Carefully excluding from the meaning of those names everything but the sensation itself, at least till we have examined it. Suppose a person who never had this sense before to receive it all at once, and to smell a rose. Can he perceive any similitude or agreement between the smell and the rose, or indeed between it and any other object whatsoever? Certainly he cannot. He finds himself affected in a new way. He knows not why or from what the cause. Like a man that feels some pain or pleasure formerly unknown to him, he is conscious that he is not the cause of it himself, but cannot, from the nature of the thing, determine whether it is caused by body or spirit, by something near or by something at a distance. It has no similitude to anything else, so as to admit of a comparison, and therefore he can conclude nothing from it, unless perhaps that there must be some unknown cause of it. It is evidently ridiculous to ascribe to it figure, color, extension, or any other quality of bodies. He cannot give it a place any more than he can give a place to melancholy or joy, nor can he conceive it to have any existence but when it is smelled, so that it appears to be a simple and original affection of feeling of the mind, altogether inexplicable and unaccountable. It is indeed impossible that it can be in any body. It is a sensation, and a sensation can only be in a sentient thing. The various odors have each their different degrees of strength and weakness. Most of them are agreeable or disagreeable, and frequently those that are agreeable when weak are disagreeable when stronger. When we compare different smells together, we can perceive very few resemblances or contrarieties, or indeed relations of any kind between them. They are all so simple in themselves, and so different from each other, that it is hardly possible to divide them into genera and species. Most of the names we give them are particular, as the smell of a rose, of a jessamine, and the like. Yet there are some general names, as sweet, stinking, musty, putrid, cadaverous, aromatic. Some of them seem to refresh and animate the mind, others to deaden and depress it. Section 3 sensation and remembrance natural principles of belief so far we have considered this sensation abstractly let us next compare it with other things to which it bears some relation at first i shall compare this sensation with the remembrance and the imagination of it i can think of the smell of a rose when i do not smell it and it is possible that when i think of it there is neither rose nor smell anywhere existing but when I smell it, I am necessarily determined to believe that the sensation really exists. This is common to all sensations, that as they cannot exist but in being perceived, so they cannot be perceived but they must exist. I could as easily doubt of my own existence, as of the existence of my sensations. Even these profound philosophers, who have endeavored to disprove their own existence, have yet left their sensations to stand upon their own bottom, stripped of a subject rather than call in question the reality of their existence here then a sensation a smell for instance may be presented to the mind three different ways it may be smelled it may be remembered it may be imagined or thought of in the first case it is necessarily accompanied with a belief of its present existence in the second it is necessarily accompanied with a belief of its past existence and in the last it is not accompanied with belief at all, but is what the logicians call a simple apprehension. Why sensation should compel our belief of the present existence of the thing, memory a belief of its past existence, and imagination no belief at all, I believe no philosopher can give a shadow of reason, but that such is the nature of these operations. They are all simple and original, and therefore inexplicable acts of the mind. Suppose that once, and only once, I smelled a tuberose in a certain room where it grew in a pot, and gave a very grateful perfume. Next day I relate what I saw and smelled. When I attend as carefully as I can to what passes in my mind in this case, it appears evident that the very thing I saw yesterday, and the fragrance I smelled, 
are now the immediate objects of my mind when I remember it. Further, I can imagine this pot and flower transported to the room where I now sit, and yielding the same perfume. Here likewise it appears that the individual thing which I saw and smelled is the object of my imagination. Philosophers indeed tell me that the immediate object of my memory and imagination in this case is not the past sensation, but an idea of it, an image, phantasm, or species of the odor I smelled, that this idea now exists in my mind, or in my sensorium, and the mind contemplating this present idea finds it a representation of what is past, or of what may exist, and accordingly calls it memory, or imagination. This is the doctrine of the ideal philosophy, which we shall not now examine, that we may not interrupt the thread of the present investigation. Upon the strictest attention, memory appears to me to have things that are past and not present ideas for its object. We shall afterwards examine this system of ideas, and endeavor to make it appear that no solid proof has ever been advanced of the existence of ideas, that they are a mere fiction and hypothesis contrived to solve the phenomena of human understanding, that they do not at all answer this end, and that this hypothesis of ideas or images of things in the mind, or in the sensorium, is the parent of those many paradoxes so shocking to common sense, and of that skepticism which disgrace our philosophy of the mind, and have brought upon it the ridicule and contempt of sensible men. In the meantime, I beg leave to think with the vulgar that when I remember the smell of a tuberose, that very sensation which I had yesterday, and which has now no more existence, is the immediate object of my memory. And, when I imagine it present, the sensation itself, and not any idea of it, is the object of my imagination. But though the object of my sensation, memory, and imagination be in this case the same, yet these acts or operations of the mind are as different and as easily distinguishable as smell, taste, and sound. I am conscious of a different kind between sensation and memory, and between both and imagination. I find this also, that the sensation compels my belief of the present existence of the smell, and memory my belief of its past existence. There is a smell, is the immediate testimony of sense, there was a smell, is the immediate testimony of memory. If you ask me why I believe that the smell exists, I can give no other reason, nor shall ever be able to give any other than that I smell it. If you ask why I believe that it existed yesterday, I can give no other reason but that I remember it. Sensation and memory, therefore, are simple, original, and perfectly distinct operations of the mind, and both of them are original principles of belief. Imagination is distinct from both, but is no principle of belief. Sensation implies the present existence of its object, memory its past existence, but imagination views its object naked and without any belief of its existence or non-existence, and is therefore what the schools call simple apprehension. Section 4 Judgment and belief, in some cases, precede simple apprehension. But here again the ideal system comes in our way. It teaches us that the first operation of the mind about its ideas is simple apprehension, that is, the bare conception of a thing without any belief about it, and that after we have got simple apprehension, by comparing them together, we perceive agreements or disagreements between them and that this perception of the agreement or disagreement of ideas is all that we call belief, judgment, or knowledge. Now this appears to me to be all fiction, without any foundation in nature, for it is acknowledged by all that sensation must go before memory and imagination, and hence it necessarily follows that apprehension, accompanied with belief and knowledge, must go before simple apprehension, at least in the matters we are now speaking of. So that here, instead of saying that the belief or knowledge is got by putting together and comparing the simple apprehensions, we ought rather to say that the simple apprehension is performed by resolving and analyzing a natural and original judgment. And it is with the operations of the mind, in this case, as with natural bodies, which are indeed compounded of simple principles or elements, 
Nature does not exhibit these elements separate to be compounded by us. She exhibits them mixed and compounded in concrete bodies, and it is only by art and chemical analysis that they can be separated. Section 5. Two theories of the nature of belief refuted. Conclusions from what hath been said. But what is this belief or knowledge which accompanies sensation and memory? Every man knows what it is, but no man can define it. Does any man pretend to define sensation, or to define consciousness? It is happy indeed that no man does. And if no philosopher had attempted to define and explain belief, some paradoxes in philosophy more incredible than ever were brought forth by the most abject superstition, or the most frantic enthusiasm, had never seen the light. Of this kind, surely, is that modern discovery of the ideal philosophy, that sensation, memory, belief, and imagination, when they have the same object, are only different degrees of strength and vivacity in the idea. Suppose the idea to be that of a future state after death. One man believes it firmly. This means no more than that he hath a strong and lively idea of it. Another neither believes nor disbelieves, that is, he has a weak and faint idea. Now suppose a third person believes firmly that there is no such thing. I am at a loss to know whether his idea be faint or lively. If it is faint, then there may be a firm belief where the idea is faint. If the idea is lively, then the belief of a future state and the belief of no future state must be one and the same. The same arguments that are used to prove that belief implies only a stronger idea of the object than simple apprehension, might as well be used to prove that love implies only a stronger idea of the object than indifference. And then, what shall we say of hatred, which must upon this hypothesis be a degree of love, or a degree of indifference? If it should be said that in love there is something more than an idea, to wit, an affection of the mind, May it not be said, with equal reason, that in belief there is something more than an idea to wit, an assent, or persuasion of the mind? But perhaps it may be thought as ridiculous to argue against this strange opinion as to maintain it. Indeed, if a man should maintain that a circle, a square, and a triangle differ only in magnitude and not in figure, I believe he would find nobody disposed either to believe him or to argue against him. And yet I do not think it less shocking to common sense to maintain that sensation, memory, and imagination differ only in degree, and not in kind. I know it is said that in a delirium or in dreaming men are apt to mistake one for the other. But does it follow from this that men who are neither dreaming nor in a delirium cannot distinguish them? But how does a man know that he is not in a delirium? I cannot tell. Neither can I tell how a man knows that he exists. But if any man seriously doubts whether he is in a delirium, I think it highly probable that he is, and that it is time to seek for a cure, which I am persuaded he will not find in the whole system of logic. I mentioned before Locke's notion of belief or knowledge. He holds that it consists in a perception of the agreement or disagreement of ideas and this he values himself upon as a very important discovery. We shall have occasion afterwards to examine more particularly this grand principle of Locke's philosophy, and to show that it is one of the main pillars of modern skepticism, although he had no intention to make that use of it. At present, let us only consider how it agrees with the instances of belief now under consideration, and whether it gives any light to them. I believe that the sensation I have exists, and that the sensation I remember does not now exist, but did exist yesterday. Here, according to Locke's system, I compare the idea of a sensation with the ideas of past and present existence. At one time, that this idea agrees with that of present existence, but disagrees with that of past existence. But at another time, it agrees with the idea of past existence, and disagrees with that of present existence. Truly, these ideas seem to be very capricious, in their agreements and disagreements. Besides, I cannot for my heart conceive what is meant by either. I say a sensation exists, and I think I understand clearly what I mean. 
but you want to make the thing clear, and for that end, tell me that there is an agreement between the idea of that sensation and the idea of existence. To speak freely, this conveys to me no light, but darkness. I can conceive no otherwise of it, than as an odd and obscure circumlocution. I conclude, then, that the belief which accompanies sensation and memory is a simple act of the mind which cannot be defined. It is in this respect, like seeing and hearing, which can never be so defined as to be understood by those who have not these faculties, and to such as have them no definition can make these operations more clear than they are already. In like manner, every man that has any belief, and he must be a curiosity that has none, knows perfectly what belief is, but also never define or explain it. I conclude also that sensation, memory, and imagination, even where they have the same object, are operations of a quite different nature, and perfectly distinguishable by those who are sound and sober. A man that is in danger of confounding them is indeed to be pitied. But whatever relief he may find from another art, he can find none from logic or metaphysic. I conclude further that it is no less part of the human constitution to believe the present existence of our sensations, and to believe the past existence of what we remember, than it is to believe that twice two make four. The evidence of sense, the evidence of memory, and the evidence of the necessary relations of things are all distinct and original kinds of evidence, equally grounded on our constitution. None of them depends upon or can be resolved into another. To reason against any of these kinds of evidence is absurd. Nay, to reason for them is absurd. They are first principles, and such fall not within the province of reason, but of common sense. Section 6. Apology for Metaphysical Absurdities. Sensation without a sentient. A consequence of the theory of ideas. Consequences of this strange opinion. Having considered the relation which the sensation of smelling bears to the remembrance and imagination of it, I proceed to consider what relation it bears to a mind or sentient principle. It is certain no man can conceive or believe smelling to exist of itself without a mind, or something that has the power of smelling, of which it is called a sensation, an operation, or feeling. Yet if any man should demand proof that sensation cannot be without a mind or sentient being, I confess that I can give none, and that to pretend to prove it seems to me almost as absurd as to deny it. This might have been said without any apology before the treatise of human nature appeared in the world, for till that time no man, as far as I know, ever thought either of calling in question that principle or of giving a reason for his belief of it. Whether thinking beings were of an ethereal or igneous nature, whether material or immaterial, was variously disputed, but that thinking is an operation of some kind of being or other was always taken for granted, as a principle that could not possibly admit of doubt. However, since the author above mentioned, who is undoubtedly one of the most acute metaphysicians that this or any age hath produced, hath treated it as a vulgar prejudice, and maintained that the mind is only a succession of ideas and impressions, without any subject, his opinion, however contrary to the common apprehensions of mankind, deserves respect. I beg, therefore, once and for all, that no offence may be taken at charging this or other metaphysical notions with absurdity, or with being contrary to the common sense of mankind. No disparagement is meant to the understandings of the authors or maintainers of such opinions. Indeed, they commonly proceed not from defect of understanding, but from an excess of refinement. The reasoning that leads to them often gives new light to the subject, and shows real genius and deep penetration in the author, and the premises do more than atone for the conclusion. If there are certain principles, as I think there are, which the constitution of our nature leads us to believe, and which we are under a necessity to take for granted in the common concerns of life, without being able to give reason for them, these are what we call the principles of common sense and what is manifestly contrary to them is what we call absurd. 
indeed if it is true and to be received as a principle of philosophy that sensation and thought may be without a thinking being it must be acknowledged to be the most wonderful discovery that this or any other age hath produced the received doctrine of ideas is the principle from which it is deduced and of which indeed it seems to be a just and natural consequence and it is probable that it would not have been so late a discovery but that it is so shocking and repugnant to the common apprehension of mankind that it is required an uncommon degree of philosophical intrepidity to usher it into the world it is a fundamental principle of the ideal system that every object of thought must be an impression or an idea that is a faint copy of some preceding impression this is a principle so commonly received that the author above mentioned although his whole system is built upon it, never offers the least proof of it. It is upon this principle, as a fixed point, that he erects his metaphysical engines to overturn heaven and earth, body and spirit, and indeed, in my apprehension, it is altogether sufficient for the purpose. For if impressions and ideas are the only objects of thought, then heaven and earth, and body and spirit, and everything you please must signify only impressions and ideas, or they must be words without any meaning. It seems, therefore, that this notion, however strange, is closely connected with the received doctrine of ideas, and we must either admit the conclusion or call in question the premises. Ideas seem to have something in their nature unfriendly to other existences. They were first introduced into philosophy in the humble character of images or representatives of things, and in this character they seemed not only to be inoffensive, but to serve admirably well for explaining the operation of the human understanding. But since men began to reason clearly and distinctly about them, they have by degrees supplanted their constituents and undermined the existence of everything but themselves. First they discarded all secondary qualities of bodies, and it was found out by their means that fire is not hot, nor snow cold, nor honey sweet, and, in a word, that heat, cold, sound, color, taste, and smell are nothing but ideas or impressions. Bishop Berkeley advanced them a step higher, and found out by just reasoning from the same principle that extension solidity, space, figure, and body, are ideas, and that there is nothing in nature but ideas and spirits. But the triumph of ideas was completed by the treatise of human nature, which discards spirits also, and leaves ideas and impressions as the sole existences in the universe. What if at last, having nothing else to contend with, they should fall foul of one another, and leave no existence in nature at all? This would surely bring philosophy into danger, for what should we have left to talk or dispute about? However, hitherto these philosophers acknowledge the existence of impressions and ideas. They acknowledge certain laws of attraction or rules of precedence according to which ideas and impressions range themselves in various forms and succeed one another, but that they should belong to a mind as its proper goods and chattel. This they have found to be a vulgar error. These ideas are as free and independent as the birds of the air, or as Epicurus's atoms when they pursued their journey in the vast inane. Shall we conceive them like the films of things in the Epicurean system? Principio hoc dico, rerum simulacra vegari, multa modis multis, in cuncta sundique partes, tenua, Que facile inter se juncentur in auris obvia convenuant. Lucretius. Or do they rather resemble Aristotle's intelligible species after they are shot forth from the object and before they have yet struck upon the passive intellect? But why should we seek to compare them with any thing, since there is nothing in nature but themselves? They make the whole furniture of the universe starting into existence or out of it without any cause, combining into parcels, which the vulgar call minds, and succeeding one another by fixed laws, 
without time, place, or author of those laws. Yet, after all, these self-existent and independent ideas look pitifully naked and destitute when left thus alone in the universe, and seem, upon the whole, to be in a worse condition than they were before. Descartes, Malebranche, and Locke, as they made much use of ideas, treated them handsomely, and provided them in decent accommodation, lodging them either in the pineal gland, or in the pure intellect, or even in the divine mind. They, moreover, clothed them with a commission, and made them representatives of things, which gave them some dignity and character. But the treatise of human nature, though no less indebted to them, seems to have made but a bad return, by bestowing upon them this independent existence, since thereby they are turned out of house and home, and set adrift in the world, without friend or connection, without a rag to cover their nakedness, and who knows but the whole system of ideas may perish by the indiscreet zeal of their friends who exalt them. However this may be, it is certainly a most amazing discovery that thought and ideas may be without any thinking being, a discovery big with consequences which cannot easily be traced by these deluded mortals who think and reason in the common track. We were always apt to imagine that thought supposed a thinker, and love a lover, and treason a traitor. But this, it seems, was all a mistake, and it is found out that there may be treason without a traitor, and love without a lover, laws without a legislator, and punishment without a sufferer, succession without time, and motion without anything moved, or space in which it may move. Or, if in these cases ideas are the lover and sufferer, the traitor, it were to be wished that the author of this discovery had further condescended to acquaint us whether ideas can converse together and be under obligations of duty or gratitude to each other, whether they can make promises and enter into leagues and covenants, and fulfill or break them, and be punished for the breach. If one set of ideas makes a covenant, another breaks it, and a third is punished for it. There is reason to think that justice is no natural virtue in this system. It seemed very natural to think that the treatise of human nature required an author, and a very ingenious one too. But now we learn that it is only a set of ideas which came together and arranged themselves by certain associations and attractions. After all, this curious system appears not to be fitted to the present state of human nature. How far it may suit some choice spirits, who are refined from the dregs of common sense, I cannot say. It is acknowledged, I think, that even these can enter into this system only in their most speculative hours, when they soar so high in pursuit of those self-existent ideas as to lose sight of all other things. But when they condescend to mingle again with the human race, and to converse with a friend, a companion, or a fellow citizen, the ideal system vanishes. Common sense, like an irresistible torrent, carries them along, and in spite of all their reasoning and philosophy, they believe their own existence and the existence of other things. Indeed, it is happy they do so, for if they should carry their closet belief into the world, the rest of mankind would consider them as diseased, and send them to an infirmary. Therefore, as Plato required certain previous qualifications of those who entered his school, I think it would be prudent for the doctors of this ideal philosophy to do the same, and to refuse admittance to every man who is so weak as to imagine that he ought to have the same belief in solitude and in company, or that his principles ought to have any influence upon his practice. For this philosophy is like a hobby-horse, which a man in bad health may ride in his closet without hurting his reputation, but if he should take him abroad with him to church, or to the exchange, or to the playhouse, his heir would immediately call a jury and seize his estate. Section 7. The conception and belief of a sentient being or mind is suggested by our Constitution. The notion of relations not always got by comparing the related ideas. Leaving this philosophy, therefore, to those who have occasion for it, and can use it discreetly as a chamber exercise, we may still inquire how the rest of mankind, and even the adepts themselves, 
except in solitary moments, have got so strong and irresistible a belief that thought must have a subject and be the act of some thinking being. How every man believes himself to be something distinct from his ideas and impressions, something which continues the same identical self when all his ideas and impressions are changed, it is impossible to trace the origin of this opinion in history, for all languages have it interwoven in their original construction. All nations have always believed it, the constitution of all laws and governments, as well as the common transactions of life, suppose it. It is no less impossible for any man to recollect when he himself came by this notion. For as far back as we can remember, we were already in possession of it, and as fully persuaded of our own existence, and the existence of other things, as that one and one make two. It seems, therefore, that this opinion preceded all reasoning, and experience, and instruction. And this is the more probable, because we could not get it by any of these means. It appears then to be an undeniable fact that from thought or sensation all mankind constantly and invariably from the first dawning of reflection do infer a power or faculty of thinking, and a permanent being or mind to which that faculty belongs, and that we as invariably ascribe all the various kinds of sensation and thought we are conscious of to one individual mind or self. But by what rules of logic we make these inferences, it is impossible to show. Nay, it is impossible to show how our sensations and thoughts can give us the very notion and conception, either of a mind or of a faculty. The faculty of smelling is something very different from the actual sensation of smelling, for the faculty may remain when we have no sensation. And the mind is no less different from the faculty, for it continues the same individual being when that faculty is lost. Yet this sensation suggests to us both a faculty and a mind, and not only suggests the notion of them, but creates a belief of their existence, although it is impossible to discover, by reason, any tie or connection between one and the other. What shall we say, then? Either these inferences which we draw from our sensations, namely the existence of a mind, and of powers or faculties belonging to it, are prejudices of philosophy or education, mere fictions of the mind, which a wise man should throw off as he does the belief of fairies, or they are judgments of nature, judgments not got by comparing ideas and perceiving agreements and disagreements, but immediately inspired by our constitution. If this last is the case, as I apprehend it is, it will be impossible to shake off those opinions, and we must yield to them at last, though we struggle hard to get rid of them. And if we could, by a determined obstinacy, shake off the principles of our nature, this is not to act the philosopher, but the fool or the madman. It is incumbent upon those who think that these are not natural principles to show in the first place how we can otherwise get the notion of a mind and its faculties, and then to show how we come to deceive ourselves into the opinion that sensation cannot be without the sentient being. It is the received doctrine of philosophers that our notions of relations can only be got by comparing the related ideas, but in the present case there seems to be an instance to the contrary. It is not by having first the notions of mind and sensation, and then comparing them together, that we perceive the one to have the relation of a subject or substratum, and the other that of an act or operation. On the contrary, one of the related things to wit, sensation, suggests to us both the correlate and the relation. I beg leave to make use of the word suggestion, because I know not one more proper to express a power of the mind which seems entirely to have escaped the notice of philosophers and to which we owe many of our simple notions, which are neither impressions nor ideas, as well as many original principles of belief. I shall endeavor to illustrate by an example what I understand by this word. We all know that a certain kind of sound suggests immediately to the mind a coach passing in the street, and not only produces the imagination, but the belief that a coach is passing. Yet there is no comparing of ideas, 
no perception of agreements or disagreements to produce this belief, nor is there the least similitude between the sound we hear and the coach we imagine and believe to be passing. It is true that this suggestion is not natural and original. It is the result of experience and habit. But I think it appears, from what hath been said, that there are natural suggestions, particularly that sensation suggests the notion of present existence, and the belief that what we perceive or feel does now exist, that memory suggests the notion of past existence, and the belief of what we remember did exist in time past, and that our sensations and thoughts do also suggest the notion of a mind, and the belief of its existence, and of its relation to our thoughts. By a like natural principle it is that a beginning of existence or any change in nature suggests to us the notion of a cause and compels our belief of its existence, and in like manner, as shall be shown when we come to the sense of touch, certain sensations of touch by the constitution of our nature suggest to us extension, solidity, and motion, which are no wise like to sensations, although they have been hitherto confounded with them. Section 8. There is a quality or virtue in bodies which we call their smell. How this is connected in the imagination with the sensation. We have considered smell as signifying a sensation, feeling, or impression upon the mind, and in this sense it can only be in a mind, or sentient being, that it is evident that mankind gave the name of smell much more frequently to something which they conceive to be external, and to be a quality of body. They understand something by it which does not at all infer a mind, and have not the least difficulty in conceiving the air perfumed with aromatic odors in the deserts of Arabia, or in some uninhabited island, where the human foot never trod. Every sensible day-laborer hath as clear a notion of this, and as full a conviction of the possibility of it, as he hath of his own existence, and can no more doubt of the one than of the other. Suppose that such a man meets with a modern philosopher, and wants to be informed what smell in plants is. The philosopher tells him that there is no smell in plants, nor in anything but in the mind, that it is impossible there can be smell but in a mind, and that all this hath been demonstrated by modern philosophy. The plain man will no doubt be apt to think him merry, but if he finds that he is serious, his next conclusion will be that he is mad, or that philosophy, like magic, puts men into a new world, and gives them different faculties from common men. And thus philosophy and common sense are set at variance. But who is to blame for it? In my opinion, the philosopher is to blame. For if he means by smell what the rest of mankind most commonly mean, he is certainly mad. But if he puts a different meaning upon the word, without observing it himself, or giving warning to others, he abuses language, and disgraces philosophy, without doing any service to truth. As if a man should exchange the meaning of the words daughter and cow, and then endeavour to prove to his plain neighbour that his cow is his daughter, and his daughter his cow. I believe there is not much more wisdom in many of these paradoxes of the ideal philosophy, which seem to plain sensible men appear to be palatable absurdities, but with the adepts pass for profound discoveries. I resolve, for my own part, always to pay great regard to the dictates of common sense, and not to depart from them without absolute necessity. And therefore I am apt to think that there is really something in the rose or lily which is by the vulgar called smell, and which continues to exist when it is not smelled, and shall proceed to inquire what this is, how we come by the notion of it, and what relation this quality or virtue of smell hath to the sensation, which we have been obliged to call by the same name for want of another. Let us, therefore, suppose, as before, a person beginning to exercise the sense of smelling. A little experience will discover to him that the nose is the organ of this sense, and that the air, or something in the air, is a medium of it. 
and finding by further experience that when a rose is near he has a certain sensation. When it is removed, the sensation is gone. He finds a connection in nature betwixt the rose and this sensation. The rose is considered as a cause, occasion, or antecedent of the sensation, the sensation as an effect or consequent of the presence of the rose. They are associated in the mind, and constantly found conjoined in the imagination. But here it deserves our notice that although the sensation may seem more closely related to the mind its subject, or to the nose its organ, yet neither of these connections operate so powerfully upon the imagination as its connection with the rose its concomitant. The reason of this seems to be that its connection with the mind is more general, and no way distinguisheth it from other smells, or even from tastes, sounds, or other kinds of sensations. The relation it hath to the organ is likewise general, and doth not distinguish it from other smells. But the connection it hath with the rose is special and constant, by which means they become almost inseparable in the imagination, in like manner as thunder and lightning, freezing and cold. Section 9. That there is a principle in human nature, from which the notion of this, as well as all other natural virtues or causes, is derived. In order to illustrate further how we come to conceive a quality or virtue in the rose, which we call smell, and what this smell is, it is proper to observe that the mind begins very early to thirst after principles which may direct it in the exertion of its powers. The smell of a rose is a certain affection or feeling of the mind, and as it is not constant, but comes and goes, we want to know when and where we may expect it, and are uneasy till we find something which, being present, brings this feeling along with it, and being removed, removes it. This, then, found we call the cause of it, not in a strict and philosophical sense, as if the feeling were really affected or produced by that cause, but in a popular sense, for the mind is satisfied if there is a constant conjunction between them, and such causes are in reality nothing else but laws of nature. Having found the smell thus constantly conjoined with the rose, the mind is at rest, without inquiring whether this conjunction is owing to a real efficiency or not that being a philosophical inquiry which does not concern human life. But every discovery of such a constant conjunction is of real importance in life, and makes a strong impression upon the mind. So ardently do we desire to find everything that happens within our observation thus connected with something else, as its cause or occasion, that we are apt to fancy connections upon the slightest grounds and this weakness is most remarkable in the ignorant, who know least of the real connections established in nature. A man meets with an unlucky accident on a certain day of the year, and knowing no other cause of his misfortune, he is apt to conceive something unlucky in that day of the calendar. And if he finds the same connection hold a second time, it is strongly confirmed in his superstition. I remember many years ago a white ox was brought into this country of so enormous a size that people came many miles to see him. There happened, some months after, an uncommon fatality among women in childbearing. Two such uncommon events following one another gave a suspicion of their connection, and occasioned a common opinion among the country people that the white ox was the cause of this fatality. However silly and ridiculous this opinion was, it sprung from the same root in human nature, on which all natural philosophy grows, namely, an eager desire to find out connections in things, and a natural, original, and unaccountable propensity to believe that the connections which we have observed in times past will continue in time to come. Omens, portents, good and bad luck, palmistry, astrology, all the numerous arts of divination and of interpreting dreams, false hypotheses and systems, and true principles in the philosophy of nature, are all built upon the same foundation in the human constitution. 
and are distinguished only according as we conclude rashly from too few instances, or cautiously from sufficient induction. As it is experience only that discovers these connections between natural causes and their effects, without inquiring further, we attribute to the cause some vague and indistinct notion of power or virtue to produce the effect. And in many cases, the purposes of life do not make it necessary to give distinct names to the cause and the effect. Whence it happens that being closely connected in the imagination, although very unlike to each other, one name serves for both, and in common discourse is most frequently applied to that which of the two is most the object of our attention. This occasions an ambiguity in many words, which, having the same causes in all language, is common to all, and is apt to be overlooked even by philosophers. Some instances will serve both to illustrate and confirm what we have said. Magnetism signifies both the tendency of the iron towards the magnet, and the power of the magnet to produce that tendency. And if it was asked whether it is a quality of the iron or of the magnet, one would perhaps be puzzled at first. But a little attention would discover that we perceive a power or virtue in the magnet as the cause, and a motion in the iron as the effect. And although these are things quite unlike, they are so united in the imagination that we give the common name of magnetism to both. The same thing may be said of gravitation, which sometimes signifies the tendencies of bodies towards the earth, sometimes the attractive power of the earth, which we conceive as the cause of that tendency. We may observe the same ambiguity in some of Sir Isaac Newton's definitions and that even in words of his own making. In three of his definitions, he explains very distinctly what he understands by the absolute quantity, what by the accelerative quantity, and what by the motive quantity of a centripetal force. In the first of these three definitions, centripetal force is put for the cause, which we conceive to be some power or virtue in the center or central body. In the last two, the same word is put for the effect of this cause in producing velocity, or in producing motion toward that center. Heat signifies a sensation, and cold a contrary one. But heat likewise signifies a quality or state of bodies, which hath no contrary but different degrees. When a man feels the same water hot on one hand, and cold to the other, this gives him occasion to distinguish between the feeling and the heat of the body. And although he knows that the sensations are contrary, he does not imagine that the body can have contrary qualities at the same time. And when he finds a different taste in the same body, in sickness and in health, he is easily convinced that the quality in the body called taste is the same as before, although the sensation he has from it are perhaps opposite. The vulgar are commonly charged by philosophers with the absurdity of imagining the smell in the rose to be something like to the sensation of smelling. But I think unjustly, for they neither give the same epithets to both, nor do they reason in the same manner from them. What is the smell in the rose? It is a quality or virtue of the rose, or of something proceeding from it which we perceive by the sense of smelling and this is all we know of the matter. But what is smelling? It is an act of the mind, but is never imagined to be a quality of the mind. Again, the sensation of smelling is conceived to infer necessarily a mind or sentient being, but smell in the rose infers no such thing. We say, this body smells sweet, that stinks, but we do not say, this mind smells sweet, and that stinks, Therefore, smell in the rose, and the sensation which it causes, are not conceived, even by the vulgar, to be things of the same kind, although they have the same name. From what hath been said, we may learn that the smell of a rose signifies two things. First, a sensation, which can have no existence but when it is perceived, and can only be in a sentient being or mind. Secondly, 
it signifies some power, quality, or virtue in the rose, or in effluvia proceeding from it, which hath a permanent existence, independent of the mind, and which by the constitution of nature produces the sensation in us. By the original constitution of our nature, we are both led to believe that there is a permanent cause of the sensation, and prompted to seek after it, and experience determines us to place it in the rose. The name of all smells, tastes, sounds, as well as heat and cold, have a like ambiguity in all languages, but it deserves our attention that these names are but rarely, in common language, used to signify the sensations. For the most part, they signify the external qualities which are indicated by the sensations. The cause of which phenomenon I take to be this. Our sensations have very different degrees of strength. Some of them are so quick and lively as to give us a great deal either of pleasure or of uneasiness. When this is the case, we are compelled to attend to the sensation itself, and to make it an object of thought and discourse. We give it a name, which signifies nothing but the sensation, and in this case we readily acknowledge that the thing meant by that name is in the mind only, and not in anything external. Such are the various kinds of pain, sickness, and the sensations of hunger, and other appetites. But where the sensation is not so interesting as to require to be made an object of thought, our constitution leads us to consider it as a sign of something external, which hath a constant conjunction with it. And, having found what it indicates, we give a name to that. The sensation, having no proper name, falls in as an accessory to the thing signified by it, and is confounded under the same name. So that the name may indeed be applied to the sensation, but most properly and commonly is applied to the thing indicated by that sensation. The sensations of smell, taste, sound, and color are of infinitely more importance as signs or indications than they are upon their own account, like the words of a language, wherein we do not attend to the sound, but to the sense. Section 10. Whether in sensation the mind is active or passive. There is one inquiry remains, whether in smelling and in other sensations the mind is active or passive. This possibly may seem to be a question about words, or at least of very small importance. However, if it leads us to attend more accurately to the operations of our minds than we are accustomed to do, it is upon that very account not altogether unprofitable. I think the opinion of modern philosophers is that in sensation the mind is altogether passive, and this undoubtedly is so far true that we cannot raise any sensation in our minds by willing it. And, on the other hand, it seems hardly possible to avoid having the sensation when the object is presented. Yet it seems likewise to be true that in proportion as the attention is more or less turned to a sensation, or diverted from it, that sensation is more or less perceived and remembered. Everyone knows that very intense pain may be diverted by a surprise or by anything that entirely occupies the mind. When we are engaged in earnest conversation, the clock may strike by us without being heard. At least we remember not the next moment that we did hear it. The noise and tumult of a great trading city is not heard by them who have lived in it all their days, but it stuns those strangers who have lived in the peaceful retirement of the country. Whether, therefore, there can be any sensation where the mind is purely passive, I will not say, but I think we are conscious of having given some attention to every sensation which we remember, though ever so recent. No doubt, where the impulse is strong and uncommon, it is as difficult to withhold attention as it is to forbear crying out in racking pain, or starting in a sudden fright. But how far both might be attained by strong resolution and practice is not easy to determine. So that, although the peripatetics had no good reason to suppose an active and a passive intellect, since attention may be well enough accounted an act of will, yet I think they came nearer to the truth in holding the mind to be in sensation 
partly passive and partly active, than the moderns in affirming it to be purely passive. Sensation, imagination, memory, and judgment have by the vulgar in all ages been considered as acts of the mind. The manner in which they are expressed in all languages shows this. When the mind is much employed in them, we say it is very active, whereas, if they were impression only, as the ideal philosophy would lead us to conceive, we ought in such a case rather to say that the mind is very passive, for I suppose no man would attribute great activity to the paper I write upon, because it receives a variety of characters. The relation which the sensation of smell bears to the memory and imagination of it, and to a mind or subject is common to all our sensations, and indeed to all the operations of the mind. The relation it bears to the will is common to it with all the powers of understanding, and the relation it bears to that quality or virtue of bodies which it indicates is common to it with the sensations of taste, hearing, color, heat, and cold, so that what hath been said of this sense may easily be applied to several of our senses, and to other operations of the mind, and this I hope will apologize for our insisting so long upon it. End of chapter 2 Recording by Stephen Reynolds Durham, Connecticut Chapter 3 of An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by Thomas Reed. Chapter 3 Of Tasting A great part of what hath been said of the sense of smelling is so easily applied to those of tasting and hearing that we shall leave the application entirely to the reader's judgment, and save ourselves the trouble of a tedious repetition. It is probable that everything that affects the taste is in some degree soluble in the saliva. It is not conceivable how anything should enter readily and of its own accord, as it were, into the pores of the tongue, palate, and fauces, unless it had some chemical affinity to that liquor with which these pores are always replete. It is, therefore, an admirable contrivance of nature that the organs of taste should always be moist with a liquor which is so universal a menstruum, and which deserves to be examined more than it hath been hitherto both in that capacity and as a medical ungent. Nature teaches dogs and other animals to use it in this last way, and its subserviency both to taste and digestion shows its efficacy in the former. It is with manifest design and propriety that the organ of this sense guards the entrance of the alimentary canal, as that of smell, the entrance of the canal for respiration, and from these organs being placed in such manner that everything that enters into the stomach must undergo the scrutiny of both senses, it is plain that they were intended by nature to distinguish wholesome food from that which is noxious. The brutes have no other means of choosing their food, nor would mankind in the savage state. And it is very probable that the smell and a taste no way vitiated by luxury or bad habits would rarely, if ever, lead us to a wrong choice of food among the production of nature, although the artificial compositions of a refined and luxurious cookery, or of chemistry and pharmacy, may often impose upon both, and produce things agreeable to the taste and smell which are noxious to health. And it is probable that both smell and taste are vitiated, and rendered less fit to perform their natural offices, by the unnatural kind of life men commonly lead in society. These senses are likewise of great use to distinguish bodies that cannot be distinguished by our other senses, and to discern the changes which the same body undergoes, 
which in many cases are sooner perceived by taste and smell than by any other means. How many things are there in the market, the eating-house, and the tavern, as well as in the apothecary and chemist's shops, which are known to be what they are given out to be, and are perceived to be good or bad in their kind only by taste or smell? And how far our judgment of things, by means of our senses, might be improved by accurate attention to the small differences of taste and smell, and other sensible qualities, is not easy to determine. Sir Isaac Newton, by a noble effort of his great genius, attempted from the color of opaque bodies to discover the magnitude of the minute pellucid parts of which they are compounded, and who knows what new lights natural philosophy may yet receive from other secondary qualities duly examined. Some tastes and smells stimulate the nerves and raise the spirits, but such an artificial elevation of the spirits is by the laws of nature followed by a depression which can only be relieved by time or by the repeated use of the like stimulus. By the use of such things we create an appetite for them, which very much resembles and hath all the force of a natural one. It is in this manner that men require an appetite for snuff, tobacco, strong liquors, laudanum, and the like. Nature seems studiously to have set bounds to the pleasures and pains we have by these two senses, and to have confined them within very narrow limits, that we might not place any part of our happiness in them, there being hardly any smell or taste so disagreeable that use will not make it tolerable, and at last perhaps agreeable, nor any so agreeable as not to lose its relish by constant use. Neither is there any pleasure or pain of these senses which is not introduced or followed by some degree of its contrary, which nearly balances it so that we may here apply the beautiful allegory of the divine Socrates, that although pleasure and pain are contrary in their nature, and their faces look different ways, yet Jupiter hath tied them so together that he that lays hold of the one draws the other along with it. As there is a great variety of smells seemingly simple and uncompounded, not only altogether unlike, but some of them contrary to others, and, as the same thing may be said of tastes, it would seem that one taste is not less different from another than it is from a smell. And therefore it may be a question how all smells come to be considered as one genus, and all tastes of another. What is the generical distinction? It is only that the nose is the organ of the one, and the palate of the other? Or, abstracting from the organ, is there not in the sensations themselves something common to smells, and something else common to tastes, whereby the one is distinguished from the other? It seems most probable that the latter is the case, and that under the appearance of the greatest simplicity there is still in these sensations something of composition. If one considers the matter abstractly, it would seem that a number of sensations, or indeed of any other individual things, which are perfectly simple and uncompounded, are incapable of being reduced into genera and species, because individuals which belong to a species must have something peculiar to each, by which they are distinguished, and something common to the whole species. And the same may be said of species which belong to one genus, and whether this does not imply some kind of composition, we shall leave to metaphysicians to determine. The sensations, both of smell and taste, do undoubtedly admit of an immense variety of modifications, which no language can express. If a man was to examine five hundred different wines, he would hardly find two of them that had precisely the same taste, the same thing holds in cheese, and in many other things. Yet of five hundred different tastes in cheese or wine, we can hardly describe twenty, so as to give a distinct notion of them to one who had not tasted them. Dr. Nehemiah Grew, a most judicious and laborious naturalist, in a discourse read before the Royal Society, anno 1675, hath endeavoured to show that there are at least sixteen different simple tastes which he enumerates. How many compound ones may be made out of all the various combinations of two, three, four, or more of these simple ones, they who are acquainted with the theory of combinations will easily perceive. All these have various degrees of intenseness and weakness. 
Many of them have other varieties. In some, the taste is more quickly perceived upon the application of the sapid body. In others, more slowly. In some, the sensation is more permanent. In others, more transient. In some, it seems to undulate, or return after certain intervals. In others, it is constant. The various parts of the organ, as the lips, the tip of the tongue, the root of the tongue, the fauces, the uvula, and the throat, are some of them chiefly affected by one sapid body, and others by another. All these and other varieties of taste, that accurate writer illustrates by a number of examples. Nor is it to be doubted but smells, if examined with the same accuracy, would appear to have as great variety. End of chapter 3 Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut Chapter 4 of An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by thomas reed chapter four of hearing section one variety of sounds their place and distance learned by custom without reasoning sounds have probably no less variety of modifications than either tastes or odors for first sounds differ in tone the ear is capable of perceiving four or five hundred variations of tone in sound and probably as many different degrees of strength. By combining these, we have above twenty thousand simple sounds that differ either in tone or strength, supposing every tone to be perfect. But it is to be observed that to make a perfect tone, a great many undulations of elastic air are required, which must all be of equal duration and extent and follow one another with perfect regularity. And each undulation must be made up of the advance and recoil of innumerable particles of elastic air, whose motions are all uniform in direction, force, and time. Hence we may easily conceive a prodigious variety in the same tone, arising from irregularities of it, occasioned by the constitution, figure, situation, or manner of striking the sonorous body from the constitution of the elastic medium, or its being disturbed by other motions, and from the constitution of the ear itself, upon which the impression is made. A flute, a violin, a hautboy, and a French horn may all sound the same tone and be easily distinguishable. Nay, if twenty human voices sound the same note, and with equal strength, there will still be some difference. The same voice, while it retains its proper distinctions, may yet be varied many ways, by sickness or health, youth or age, leanness or fatness, good or bad humor. The same words spoken by foreigners and natives, nay, by persons of different provinces of the same nation, may be distinguished. Such an immense variety of sensations of smell, taste, and sound surely was not given us in vain. They are signs by which we know and distinguish things without us, and it was fit that the variety of the signs should in some degree correspond with the variety of things signified by them. It seems to be by custom that we learn to distinguish both the place of things and their nature by means of their sound. That such a noise is in the street, such another in the room above me, that this is a knock at my door, that a person walking upstairs is probably learnt by experience. I remember that once lying abed and having been put into a fright, I heard my own heart beat, but I took it to be one knocking at the door, and arose and opened the door oftener than once, before I discovered that the sound was in my own breast. It is probable that previous to all experience we should as little know whether a sound came from the right or left, from above or below, from a great or small distance as we should know whether it was the sound of a drum, or a bell, or a cart. 
nature is frugal in her operations and will not be at the expense of a particular instinct to give us that knowledge which experience will soon produce by means of a general principle of human nature for a little experience by the constitution of human nature ties together not only in our imagination but in our belief those things which were in their nature unconnected when i hear a certain sound i conclude immediately without reasoning that a coach passes by there are no premises from which this conclusion is inferred by any rules of logic it is the effect of a principle of our nature common to us with the brutes although it is by hearing that we are capable of the perceptions of harmony and melody and of all charms of music yet it would seem that these require a higher faculty which we call a musical ear. This seems to be in very different degrees in those who have the bare faculty of hearing equally perfect, and therefore ought not to be classed with the external sense, but in a higher order. Section 2. Of Natural Language. One of the noblest purposes of sound undoubtedly is language, without which mankind would hardly be able to attain any degree of improvement above the brutes. Language is commonly considered as purely an invention of men, who by nature are no less mute than the brutes, but having a superior degree of invention and reason, have been able to contrive artificial signs of their thoughts and purposes, and to establish them by common consent. But the origin of language deserves to be more carefully inquired into, not only as this inquiry may be of importance for the improvement of language, but as it is related to the present subject and tends to lay open some of the first principles of human nature i shall therefore offer some thoughts upon this subject by language i understand all of those signs which mankind use in order to communicate to others their thoughts and intentions their purposes and desires and such signs may be conceived to be of two kinds first such as have no meaning but what is affixed to them by compact or agreement among those who use them these are artificial signs. Secondly, such as, previous to all compact or agreement, have a meaning which every man understands by the principles of his nature. Language, so far as it consists of artificial signs, may be called artificial. So far as it consists of natural signs, I call it natural. Having premised these definitions, I think it is demonstrable that if mankind had not a natural language, they could never have invented an artificial one by their reason and ingenuity. For all artificial language supposes some compact or agreement to affix a certain meaning to certain signs. Therefore, there must be compacts or agreements before the use of artificial signs, but there can be no compact or agreement without signs, nor without language and therefore there must be a natural language before any artificial language can be invented, which was to be demonstrated. Had language in general been a human invention, as much as writing or printing, we should find whole nations as mute as the brutes. Indeed, even the brutes have some natural signs by which they express their own thoughts, affections, and desires, and understand those of others. A chick, as soon as hatched, understands the different sounds whereby its dam calls it to food, or gives the alarm of danger. A dog or a horse understands by nature when the human voice caresses and when it threatens him. But brutes, as far as we know, have no notion of contracts or covenants, or of moral obligation to perform them. If nature had given them these notions, she would probably have given them natural signs to express them. And where nature has denied these notions, it is as impossible to acquire them by art, as it is for a blind man to acquire the notion of colors. Some brutes are sensible of honor, or disgrace. They have resentment and gratitude. But none of them, as far as we know, can make a promise, or plight their faith, having no such notions from their constitution. And if mankind had not these notions by nature, and natural signs to express them by, with all their wit and ingenuity, they could never have invented language. The elements of this natural language of mankind, or the signs that are naturally expressive of our thoughts, may, I think, be reduced to these three kinds. Modulations of the voice, gestures, and features. 
By means of these, two savages who have no common artificial language can converse together, can communicate their thoughts in some tolerable manner, can ask and refuse, affirm and deny, threaten and supplicate, can traffic, enter into covenants, and plight their faith. This might be confirmed by historical fact, of undoubted credit, if it were necessary. Mankind, having thus a common language by nature, though a scanty one, adapted only to the necessities of nature, there is no great ingenuity required in improving it by the addition of artificial signs to supply the deficiency of the natural. These artificial signs must multiply with the arts of life and the improvements of knowledge. The articulations of the voice seem to be, of all signs, the most proper for artificial language and as mankind have universally used them for that purpose, we may reasonably judge that nature intended them for it. But nature probably does not intend that we should lay aside the use of the natural signs. It is enough that we supply their defects by artificial ones. A man that rides always in a chariot by degrees loses the use of his legs, and one who uses artificial signs only loses both the knowledge and use of the natural. Dumb people retain much more of the natural language than others, because necessity obliges them to use it. And for the same reason, savages have much more of it than civilized nations. It is by natural signs chiefly that we give force and energy to language, and the less language has of them, it is the less expressive and persuasive. Thus, writing is less expressive than reading, and reading less expressive than speaking without book. Speaking without the proper and natural modulations, force, and variations of the voice is a frigid and dead language compared with that which is attended with them. It is still more expressive when we add the language of the eyes and features, and is then only in its perfect and natural state, and attended with its proper energy, when to all these we superadd the force of action. Where speech is natural, it will be an exercise not of the voice and lungs only, but of all the muscles of the body, like that of dumb people and savages, whose language, as it has more of nature, is more expressive and is more easily learned. Is it not pity that the refinements of a civilized life, instead of supplying the defects of natural language, should root it out and plant in its stead dull and lifeless articulations of unmeaning sounds, or the scrawling of insignificant characters? The perfection of language is commonly thought to be to express human thoughts and sentiments distinctly by these dull signs. But if this is the perfection of artificial language, it is surely the corruption of the natural. Artificial signs signify, but they do not express. They speak to the understanding as algebraical characters may do, but the passions, the affections, and the will hear them not. These continue dormant and inactive, till we speak to them in the language of nature, to which they are all attention and obedience. It were easy to show that the fine arts of the musician, the painter, the actor, and the orator, so far as they are expressive, although the knowledge of them requires in us a delicate taste, a nice judgment, and much study and practice. Yet they are nothing else but the language of nature, which we brought into the world with us, but have unlearned by disuse, and so find the greatest difficulty in recovering it. Abolish the use of articulate sounds, and writing among mankind for a century, and every man would be a painter, an actor, and an orator. We mean not to affirm that such an expedient is practicable, or, if it were, that the advantage would counterbalance the loss but that as men are led by nature and necessity to converse together, they will use every mean in their power to make themselves understood. And where they cannot do this by artificial signs, they will do it as far as possible by natural ones. And he that understands perfectly the use of natural signs must be the best judge in all the expressive arts. End of chapter 4 Recording by Stephen Reynolds Durham, Connecticut. Chapter 5 of An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by Thomas Reed Chapter 5 Of Touch Section 1 Of Heat and Cold the senses which we have hitherto considered are very simple and uniform, each of them exhibiting only one kind of sensation, and thereby indicating only one quality of bodies. By the ear we perceive sounds and nothing else, by the palate tastes, and by the nose odors. These qualities are all likewise of one order, being all secondary qualities. Whereas by touch we perceive not one quality only, but many, and those of very different kinds. The chief of them are heat and cold, hardness and softness, roughness and smoothness, figure, solidity, motion, and extension. We shall consider these in order. As to heat and cold, it will easily be allowed that they are secondary qualities of the same order with smell, taste, and sound and therefore what hath been already said of smell is easily applicable to them. That is, that the words heat and cold have each of them two significations. They sometimes signify certain sensations of the mind, which can have no existence when they are not felt, nor can exist anywhere but in a mind, or sentient being. But more frequently they signify equality of bodies, which, by the laws of nature, occasions the sensations of heat and cold in us a quality which though connected by custom so closely with the sensation that we cannot without difficulty separate them yet hath not the least resemblance to it and may continue to exist when there is no sensation at all the sensations of heat and cold are perfectly known for they neither are nor can be anything else than what we feel them to be but the qualities in bodies which we call heat and cold are unknown they are only conceived by us as unknown causes or occasions of the sensations to which we give the same names. But though common sense says nothing of the nature of these qualities, it plainly dictates the existence of them, and to deny that there can be heat and cold when they are not felt is an absurdity too gross to merit confutation. For what could be more absurd than to say that the thermometer cannot rise or fall unless some person be present? or that the coast of Guinea would be as cold as Nova Zembla if it had no inhabitants. It is the business of philosophers to investigate by proper experiments and induction what heat and cold are in bodies, and whether they make heat a particular element diffused through nature and accumulated in the heated body, or whether they make it a certain vibration of the parts of the heated body, whether they determine that heat and cold are contrary qualities, as the sensations undoubtedly are contrary, or that heat only is a quality and cold its privation. These questions are within the province of philosophy, for common sense says nothing on the one side or the other. But whatever be the nature of that quality in bodies which we call heat, we certainly know this, that it cannot in the least resemble the sensation of heat. It is no less absurd to suppose a likeness between the sensation and the quality than it would be to suppose that the pain of the gout resembles a square or a triangle. The simplest man that hath common sense does not imagine the sensation of heat, or anything that resembles that sensation, to be in the fire. He only imagines that there is something in the fire which makes him and other sentient beings feel heat. Yet, as the name of heat in common language more frequently and more properly signifies this unknown something in the fire than the sensation occasioned by it, he justly laughs at the philosopher, who denies that there is any heat in the fire, and thinks that he speaks contrary to common sense. Section 2 of Hardness and Softness Let us next consider hardness and softness by which words we always understand real properties or qualities of bodies of which we have a distinct conception. 
when the parts of a body adhere so firmly that it cannot easily be made to change its figure we call it hard when its parts are easily displaced we call it soft this is the notion which all mankind have of hardness and softness they are neither sensations nor like any sensations they were real qualities before they were perceived by touch and continue to be so when they are not perceived for if any man will affirm that diamonds were not hard till they were handled who would reason with him there is no doubt a sensation by which we perceive a body to be hard or soft this sensation of hardness may easily be had by pressing one's hand against the table and attending to the feeling that ensues setting aside as much as possible all thought of the table and its qualities or of any external thing but it is one thing to have the sensation and another to attend to it and make it a distinct object of reflection the first is very easy the last in most cases extremely difficult we are so accustomed to use the sensation as a sign and to pass immediately to the hardness signified that as far as appears it was never made an object of thought either by the vulgar or by philosophers nor has it a name in any language there is no sensation more distinct or more frequent yet it is never attended to but passes through the mind instantaneously and serves only to introduce that quality in bodies which by a law of our constitution it suggests there are indeed some cases wherein it is no difficult matter to attend to the sensation occasioned by the hardness of a body for instance when it is so violent as to occasion considerable pain then nature calls upon us to attend to it and then we acknowledge that it is a mere sensation and can only be in a sentient being if a man runs his head with violence against a pillar i appeal to him whether the pain he feels resembles the hardness of the stone or if he can conceive anything like what he feels to be in an inanimate piece of matter the attention of the mind is here entirely turned towards the painful feeling and to speak in the common language of mankind he feels nothing in the stone but feels a violent pain in his head it is quite otherwise when he leans his head gently against the pillar for then he will tell you that he feels nothing in his head but feels hardness in the stone hath he not a sensation in this case as well as in the other undoubtedly he hath but it is a sensation which nature intended only as a sign of something in the stone and accordingly he instantly fixes his attention upon the thing signified and cannot without great difficulty attend so much to the sensation as to be persuaded that there is any such thing distinct from the hardness it signifies but however difficult it may be to attend to this fugitive sensation to stop its rapid progress and to disjoin it from the external quality of hardness in whose shadow it is apt immediately to hide itself this is what a philosopher by pains and practice must attain otherwise it will be impossible for him to reason justly upon this subject or even to understand what is here advanced for the last appeal in subjects of this nature must be to what a man feels and perceives in his own mind it is indeed strange that a sensation which we have every time we feel a body hard and which consequently we can command as often and continue as long as we please a sensation as distinct and determinate as any other should yet be so much unknown and never to have been made an object of thought and reflection nor to have been honored with any name in any language that philosophers as well as the vulgar should have entirely overlooked it or confounded it with that quality of bodies which we call hardness to which it hath not the least similitude may we not conclude that the knowledge of the human faculties is but in its infancy that we have not yet learned to attend to those operations of the mind of which we are conscious every hour of our lives that there are habits of inattention acquired very early which are as hard to be overcome as other habits for i think it is probable that the novelty of this sensation will procure some attention to it in children at first but being in no wise interesting in itself as soon as it becomes familiar it is overlooked and the attention turns solely to that which it signifies 
Thus, when one is learning a language, he attends to the sounds. But when he is master of it, he attends only to the sense of what he would express. If this is the case, we must become as little children again, if we will be philosophers. We must overcome this habit of inattention, which has been gathering strength ever since we began to think, a habit the usefulness of which in common life atones for the difficulty it creates in the philosopher in discovering the first principles of the human mind. The firm cohesion of the parts of a body is no more like that sensation by which I perceive it to be hard than the vibration of a sonorous body is like the sound I hear. Nor can I possibly perceive, by my own reason, any connection between the one and the other. No man can give a reason why the vibration of a body might not have given the sensation of smelling, and the effluvia of bodies affected our hearing, if it had so pleased our Maker. In like manner, no man can give a reason why the sensation of smell, or taste, or sound might not have indicated hardness, as well as that sensation which by our constitution does indicate it. Indeed, no man can conceive any sensation to resemble any known quality of bodies. Nor can any man show by any good argument that all our sensations might not have been as they are, though no body nor quality of body had ever existed. Here, then, is a phenomenon of human nature which comes to be resolved. Hardness of bodies is a thing that we conceive as distinctly and believe as firmly as anything in nature. We have no way of coming at this conception and belief but by means of certain sensations of touch to which hardness hath not the least similitude. Nor can we by any rules of reasoning infer the one from the other. The question is how we come by this conception and belief. First, as to the conception. Shall we call it an idea of sensation or of reflection? The last will not be affirmed, and as little can the first, unless we call that an idea of sensation, which hath no resemblance to any sensation. So that the origin of this idea of hardness, one of the most common and most distinct we have, is not to be found in all our system of the mind, not even in those which have so copiously endeavoured to deduce all our notions from sensations and reflection. But secondly, supposing we have got the conception of hardness, how come we by the belief of it? Is it self-evident, from comparing the ideas, that such a sensation could not be felt unless such a quality of bodies existed? No. Can it be proved by probable or certain arguments? No, it cannot. Have we got this belief, then, by tradition, by education, or by experience? No, it is not got in any of these ways. Shall we then throw off this belief as having no foundation in reason? Alas, it is not in our power. It triumphs over reason, and laughs at all the arguments of philosophers. Even the author of the Treatise of Human Nature, though he saw no reason for this belief, but many against it, could hardly conquer it in his speculative and solitary moments. At other times he fairly yielded to it, and confesses that he found himself under a necessity to do so. What shall we say, then, of this conception, and this belief, which are so unaccountable and untractable? I see nothing left but to conclude that by an original principle of our constitution a certain sensation of touch both suggests to the mind the conception of hardness and creates the belief of it, or, in other words, that the sensation is a natural sign of hardness, and this I shall endeavour more fully to explain. Section 3 of Natural Signs As in artificial signs, there is often neither similitude between the sign and the thing signified, nor any connection that arises necessarily from the nature of the things, so it is also in natural signs. The word gold has no similitude to the substance signified by it, nor is it in its own nature more fit to signify this than any other substance. Yet by habit and custom it suggests this and no other. In like manner a sensation of touch suggests hardness, although it hath neither similitude to hardness, nor, as far as we can perceive, any necessary connection with it. The difference betwixt these two signs lies only in this, 
that in the first the suggestion is the effect of habit and custom in the second it is not the effect of habit but of the original constitution of our minds it appears evident from what hath been said on the subject of language that there are natural signs as well as artificial and particularly that the thoughts purposes and dispositions of the mind have their natural signs in the features of the face the modulation of the voice and the motion and attitude of the body that without a natural knowledge of the connection between these signs and the things signified by them language could never have been invented and established among men and that the fine arts are all founded upon the disconnection which we may call the natural language of mankind it is now proper to observe that there are different orders of natural signs and to point out the different classes into which they may be distinguished that we may more distinctly conceive the relation between our sensations and the things they suggest and what we mean by calling sensations signs of external things the first class of natural signs comprehends those whose connection with the thing signified is established by nature but discovered only by experience the whole of genuine philosophy consists in discovering such connections and reducing them to general rules the great lord Virolam had a perfect comprehension of this when he called it an interpretation of nature no man ever more distinctly understood or happily expressed the nature and foundation of the philosophic art what is all we know of mechanics astronomy and optics but connections established by nature and discovered by experience or observation and consequences deduced from them all the knowledge we have in agriculture gardening chemistry and medicine is built upon the same foundation and if ever our philosophy concerning the human mind is carried so far as to deserve the name of science which ought never to be despaired of it must be by observing facts reducing them to general rules and drawing just conclusions from them what we commonly call natural causes might with more propriety be called natural signs and what we call effects the things signified the causes have no proper efficiency or causality as far as we know and all we can certainly affirm is that nature hath established a constant conjunction between them and the things called their effects and hath given to mankind a disposition to observe these connections to confide in their continuance and to make use of them for the improvement of our knowledge and increase of our power the second class is that wherein the connection between the sign and things signified is not only established by nature but discovered to us by a natural principle without reasoning or experience of this kind are the natural signs of human thoughts purposes and desires which have been already mentioned as the natural language of mankind an infant may be put into a fright by an angry countenance and soothed again by smiles and blandishments a child that has a good musical ear may be put to sleep or to dance may be made merry or sorrowful by the modulation of musical sounds the principles of all the fine arts and of what we call a fine taste may be resolved into connections of this kind a fine taste may be improved by reasoning and experience but if the first principles of it were not planted in our minds by nature it could never be acquired nay we have already made it appear that a great part of this knowledge which we have by nature is lost by the disuse of natural signs and the substitution of artificial ones in their place a third class of natural signs comprehends those which though we never before had any notion or conception of the things signified do suggest it or conjure it up as it were by a natural kind of magic and at once give us a conception and create a belief of it i showed formerly that our sensations suggest to us a sentient being or mind to which they belong a being which hath a permanent existence although the sensations are transient and of short duration a being which is still the same while its sensations and other operations are varied ten thousand ways a being which hath the same relation to all that infinite variety of thoughts purposes actions affections 
enjoyments, and sufferings which we are conscious of or can remember. The conception of a mind is neither an idea of sensation nor of reflection, for it is neither like any of our sensations nor like anything we are conscious of. The first conception of it, as well as the belief of it, and of the common relation it bears to all that we are conscious of or remember, is suggested to every thinking being we do not know how. The notion of hardness in bodies, as well as the belief of it, are got in a similar manner, being by an original principle of our nature annexed to that sensation which we have when we feel a hard body. And so, naturally and necessarily, does the sensation convey the notion and belief of hardness, that hitherto they have been confounded by the most acute inquirers into the principles of human nature, although they appear upon accurate reflection, not only to be different things, but as unlike as pain is to the point of a sword. It may be observed that as the first class of natural signs I have mentioned is the foundation of true philosophy, and the second the foundation of the fine arts, or of taste, so the last is the foundation of common sense, a part of human nature which hath never been explained. I take it for granted that the notion of hardness, and the belief of it, is first got by means of that particular sensation, which as far back as we can remember, does invariably suggest it, and that if we had never had such a feeling, we should never have had any notion of hardness. I think it is evident that we cannot, by reasoning, from our sensations, collect the existence of bodies at all, far less any of their qualities. This hath been proved by unanswerable arguments by the Bishop of Cloyne, and by the author of the Treatise of Human Nature. It appears as evident that this connection between our sensations and the conception and belief of external existences cannot be produced by habit, experience, education, or any principle of human nature that hath been admitted by philosophers. At the same time, it is a fact that such sensations are invariably connected with the conception and belief of external existences. Hence, by all rules of just reasoning, we must conclude that this connection is the effect of our constitution, and ought to be considered as an original principle of human nature, till we find some more general principle into which it may be resolved. Section 4 of hardness and other primary qualities. Further, I observe that hardness is a quality of which we have as clear and distinct a conception as of anything whatsoever. The cohesion of the parts of a body, with more or less force, is perfectly understood, though its cause is not. We know what it is, as well as how it affects the touch. It is therefore a quality of quite different order, from those secondary qualities we have already taken notice of, whereof we know no more naturally than that they are adapted to raise certain sensations in us. If hardness were a quality of the same kind, it would be a proper inquiry for philosophers, what hardness in bodies is, and we should have had various hypotheses about it, as well as about color and heat. But it is evident that any such hypothesis would be ridiculous. If any man should say that hardness in bodies is a certain vibration of their parts, or that it is a certain effluvia emitted by them which affect our touch in the manner we feel, such hypotheses would shock common sense, because we all know that if the parts of a body adhere strongly, it is hard, although it should neither emit effluvia nor vibrate. Yet at the same time no man can say but the effluvia or the vibration of the parts of a body might have affected our touch, in the same manner that hardness now does, if it had so pleased the author of our nature, and if either of these hypotheses is applied to explain a secondary quality, such as smell, or taste, or sound, or color, or heat, there appears no manifest absurdity in the supposition. The distinction betwixt primary and secondary qualities hath had several revolutions, Democritus and Epicurus, and their followers maintained it. Aristotle and the Peripatetics abolished it. Descartes, Malebranche, and Locke revived it, and were thought to have put it in a very clear light. But Bishop Berkeley again discarded this distinction, 
by such proofs as must be convincing to those that hold the received doctrine of ideas. Yet, after all, there appears to be a real foundation for it in the principles of our nature. What hath been said of hardness is so easily applicable not only to its opposite, softness, but likewise to roughness and smoothness, to figure and motion, that we may be excused from making the application which would only be a repetition of what hath been said. All these, by means of certain corresponding sensations of touch, are presented to the mind as real external qualities. The conception and the belief of them are invariably connected with the corresponding sensations, by an original principle of human nature. Their sensations have no name in any language. They have not only been overlooked by the vulgar, but by philosophers. Or, if they have been at all taken notice of, they have been confounded with the external qualities which they suggest. Section 5. Of Extension. It is further to be observed that hardness and softness, roughness and smoothness, figure and motion, do all suppose extension, and cannot be conceived without it. Yet I think it must, on the other hand, be allowed that if we had ever felt anything hard or soft, rough or smooth, figured or moved, we should never have had a conception of extension. So that as there is good ground to believe that the notion of extension could not be prior to that of any other primary qualities, so it is certain that it could not be posterior to the notion of any of them, being necessarily implied in all of them. Extension, therefore, seems to be a quality suggested to us by the very same sensations which suggest the other qualities above mentioned. When I grasp a ball in my hand, I perceive it at once hard, figured, and extended. The feeling is very simple, and hath not the least resemblance to any quality of body. Yet it suggests to us three primary qualities, perfectly distinct from one another, as well as from the sensation which indicates them. When I move my hand along the table, the feeling is so simple that I find it difficult to distinguish it into things of different natures. Yet it immediately suggests hardness, smoothness, extension, and motion, things of very different natures, and all of them distinctly understood as the feeling which suggests them. We are commonly told by philosophers that we get the idea of extension by feeling along the extremities of a body, as if there were no manner of difficulty in the matter. I have sought with great pains, I confess, to find out how this idea can be got by feeling, but I have sought in vain. Yet it is one of the clearest and most distinct notions we have, nor is there anything whatsoever about which the human understanding can carry on so many long and demonstrative trains of reasoning. The notion of extension is so familiar to us from infancy, and so constantly obtruded by everything we see and feel, that we are apt to think it obvious how it comes into the mind. But upon a narrower examination, we shall find it utterly inexplicable. It is true we have feelings of touch which every moment present extension to the mind. But how they come to do so is the question. For those feelings do no more resemble extension than they resemble justice or courage. Nor can the existence of extended things be inferred from those feelings by any rules of reasoning, so that the feelings we have by touch can neither explain how we get the notion nor how we come by the belief of extended things. What hath imposed upon philosophers in this matter is that the feelings of touch which suggest primary qualities have no names, nor are they ever reflected upon. They pass through the mind instantaneously, and serve only to introduce the notion and belief of external things, which by our constitution are connected with them. They are natural signs, and the mind immediately passes to the thing signified, without making the least reflection upon the sign, or observing that there was any such thing. Hence it hath always been taken for granted that the idea of extension, figure, and motion are ideas of sensation, which enter into the mind by the sense of touch, in the same manner as the sensations of sound and smell do by the ear and nose. 
The sensations of touch are so connected by our constitution with the notions of extension, figure, and motion, that philosophers have mistaken the one for the other, and never have been able to discern that they were not only distinct things, but altogether unlike. However, if we will reason distinctly upon this subject, we ought to give names to those feelings of touch. We must accustom ourselves to attend to them, and to reflect upon them, that we may be able to disjoin them from, and to compare them with the qualities signified or suggested by them. The habit of doing this is not to be attained without pains and practice, and till a man hath acquired this habit, it will be impossible for him to think distinctly, or to judge right upon this subject. Let a man press his hand against the table. He feels it hard. But what is the meaning of this? The meaning undoubtedly is that he hath a certain feeling of touch, from which he concludes, without any reasoning or comparing ideas, that there is something external really existing, whose parts stick so firmly together that they cannot be displaced without considerable force. There is here a feeling, and a conclusion drawn from it, or some way suggested by it. In order to compare these we must view them separately, and then consider by what tie they are connected, and wherein they resemble one another. The hardness of the table is the conclusion, the feeling is the medium by which we are led to that conclusion. Let a man attend distinctly to this medium, and to the conclusion, and he will perceive them to be as unlike as any two things in nature. The one is a sensation of the mind, which can have no existence but in a sentient being, nor can it exist one moment longer than it is felt. The other is in the table, and we conclude without any difficulty that it was in the table before it was felt, and continues after the feeling is over. The one implies no kind of extension, nor parts, nor cohesion. The other implies all these. Both indeed admit of degrees, and the feeling beyond a certain degree is a species of pain. But adamantine hardness does not imply the least pain. And as the feeling hath no similitude to hardness, so neither can our reason perceive the least tie or connection between them. Nor will the logician ever be able to show a reason why we should conclude hardness from this feeling rather than softness or any other quality whatsoever. But in reality, all mankind are led by their constitution to conclude hardness from this feeling. The sensation of heat, and the sensation we have by pressing a hard body, are equally feelings. Nor can we by reasoning draw any conclusion from the one, but what may be drawn from the other. But by our constitution we conclude from the first an obscure or occult quality, of which we have only this relative conception, that it is something adapted to raise in us the sensation of heat. From the second, we conclude a quality of which we have a clear and distinct conception, to wit, the hardness of the body. Section 6. Of Extension. To put this matter in another light, it may be proper to try whether from sensation alone we can collect any notion of extension, figure, motion, and space. I take it for granted that a blind man hath the same notions of extension, figure, and motion as a man that sees, that Dr. Saunderson had the same notion of a cone, a cylinder, and a sphere, and of the motions and distances of the heavenly bodies as Sir Isaac Newton. As sight, therefore, is not necessary for our acquiring these notions, we shall leave it out altogether in our inquiry into the first origin of them, and shall suppose a blind man, by some strange distemper, to have lost all the experience and habits and notions he got by touch, nor to have the least conception of the existence, figure, dimensions, or extension, either of his own body or of any other, but to have all his knowledge of external things, to acquire anew, by means of sensation, and the power of reason, which we suppose to remain entire. We shall first suppose his body fixed immovably in one place, and that he can only have the feelings of touch by the application of other bodies to it. Suppose him first to be pricked with a pin. This will no doubt give a smart sensation. He feels pain. But what can he infer from it? 
nothing surely with regard to the existence or figure of a pin, he can infer nothing from this species of pain which he may not as well infer from the gout or sciatica. Common sense may lead him to think that this pain has a cause, but whether this cause is body or spirit, extended or unextended, figured or not figured, he cannot possibly, from any principles he is supposed to have, form the least conjecture. Having had formerly no notion of body or of extension, the prick of a pin can give him none. Suppose next a body not pointed but blunt is applied to his body with a force gradually increased until it bruises him. What has he got by this but another sensation, or train of sensations, from which he is able to conclude as little as from the former? A serious tumor in any inward part of the body, by pressing upon the adjacent parts, may give the same kind of sensation as the pressure of an external body, without conveying any notion but that of pain, which surely hath no resemblance to extension. Suppose, thirdly, that the body applied to him touches a larger or a lesser part of his body. Can this give him any notion of its extension or dimensions? To me it seems impossible that it should, unless he had some previous notion of the dimensions and figure of his own body, to serve him as a measure. When my two hands touch the extremities of a body, if I know them to be a foot asunder, I easily collect that the body is a foot long and if I know them to be five feet asunder, that it is five feet long. But if I know not what the distance of my hands is, I cannot know the length of the object they grasp. And if I have no previous notion of hands at all, or of distance between them, I can never get that notion by their being touched. Suppose again that a body is drawn along his hands or face while they are at rest. Can this give him any notion of space or motion? It no doubt gives a new feeling, but how it should convey a notion of space, or motion, to one who had none before, I cannot conceive. The blood moves along the arteries and veins, and this motion, when violent, is felt. But I imagine no man by this feeling could get the conception of space, or motion, if he had it not before. Such a motion may give a certain succession of feelings, as the colic may do. But no feelings, nor any combination of feelings, can ever resemble space or motion. Let us next suppose that he makes some instinctive effort to move his head, or his hand, but that no motion follows, either on account of external resistance, or of palsy. Can this effort convey the notion of space and motion to one who has never had it before? Surely it cannot. Last of all, let us suppose that he moves a limb by instinct without having had any previous notion of space or motion. He has here a new sensation, which accompanies the flexure of the joints, and the swelling of muscles. But how this sensation can convey into his mind the idea of space and motion is still altogether mysterious and unintelligible. The motions of the heart and lungs are all performed by the contraction of muscles, yet give no conception of space or motion. An embryo in the womb has many such motions, and probably the feelings that accompany them, without any idea of space or motion. Upon the whole, it appears that our philosophers have imposed upon themselves, and upon us, in pretending to deduce from sensation the first origin of our notions of external existences, of space, motion, and extension, and all the primary qualities of body, that is, the qualities whereof we have the most clear and distinct conception. These qualities do not at all tally with any system of the human faculties that hath been advanced. They have no resemblance to any sensation, or to any operation of our minds, and therefore they cannot be ideas either of sensation or of reflection. The very conception of them is irreconcilable to the principles of all our philosophic systems of understanding, the belief of them is no less so. Section 8. Of the Existence of a Material World It is beyond our power to say when or in what order we came by our notion of these qualities. When we trace the operation of our minds as far back as memory and reflection can carry us, we find them already in possession of our imagination and belief, and quite familiar to the mind. 
but how they came first into its acquaintance, or what has given them so strong a hold of our belief, and what regard they deserve, are no doubt very important questions in the philosophy of human nature. Shall we, with the Bishop of Cloyne, serve them with a quo warranto, and have them tried at the bar of philosophy, upon the statute of the ideal system? Indeed, in this trial they seem to have come off very pitifully. For, although they had very able counsel, learned in the law, viz. Descartes, Malebranche, and Locke, who said everything they could for their clients, the Bishop of Cloyne, believing them to be aiders and abettors of heresy and schism, prosecuted them with great vigor, fully answered all that had been pleaded in their defense, and silenced their ablest advocates, who seem for half a century past to decline the argument, and to trust the favor of the jury rather than to the strength of their pleadings. Thus the wisdom of philosophy is set in opposition to the common sense of mankind. The first pretends to demonstrate a priori that there can be no such thing as a material world, that sun, moon, stars, and earth, vegetable and animal bodies, are, and can be nothing else but sensations in the memory and imagination, that like pain and joy they can have no existence when they are not thought of. The last can conceive no otherwise of this opinion than as a kind of metaphysical lunacy, and concludes that too much learning is apt to make men mad, and that the man who seriously entertains this belief, though in other respects he may be a very good man, as a man may be who believes that he is made of glass. Yet surely he hath a soft place in his understanding, and hath been hurt by much thinking. This opposition betwixt philosophy and common sense is apt to have a very unhappy influence upon the philosopher himself. He sees human nature in an odd, unamiable, and mortifying light. He considers himself and the rest of his species as born under a necessity of believing ten thousand absurdities and contradictions, and endowed with such a pittance of reason as is just sufficient to make this unhappy discovery. And this is all the fruit of his profound speculations. Such notions of human nature tend to slacken every nerve of the soul, to put every noble purpose and sentiment out of countenance, and spread a melancholy gloom over the whole face of things. If this is wisdom, let me be deluded with the vulgar. I find something within me that recoils against it, and inspires more reverent sentiments of the human kind and of the universal administration. Common sense and reason have both one author, that almighty author, in all whose other works we observe a consistency uniformity, and beauty, which charm and delight the understanding. There must therefore be some order and consistency in the human faculties, as well as in other parts of his workmanship. A man that thinks reverently of his own kind, and esteems true wisdom and philosophy, will not be found, nay, will be very suspicious of such strange and paradoxical opinions. If they are false, they disgrace philosophy, and if they are true, they degrade the human species, and make us justly ashamed of our frame. To what purpose is it for philosophy to decide against common sense in this way or any other matter? The belief of a material world is older and of more authority than any principles of philosophy. It declines the tribunal of reason, and laughs at all the artillery of the logician. It retains its sovereign authority, in spite of all the edicts of philosophy, and reason itself must stoop to its orders. Even those philosophers who have disowned the authority of our notions of an external material world confess that they find themselves under a necessity of submitting to their power. Methinks, therefore, it were better to make a virtue of necessity, and since we cannot get rid of the vulgar notions and belief of an external world, to reconcile our reason to it as well as we can. For if reason should stomach and fret ever so much at this yoke, she cannot throw it off. If she will not be the servant of common sense, she must be her slave. In order, therefore, to reconcile reason to common sense in this matter, I beg leave to offer the consideration of philosophers these two observations. First, 
that in all this debate about the existence of a material world, it hath been taken for granted, on both sides, that this same material world, if any such there be, must be the express image of our sensations, that we can have no conception of any material thing which is not like some sensation in our minds, and particularly that the sensations of touch are images of extension, hardness, figure, and motion. Every argument brought against the existence of a material world, either by the Bishop of Cloyne, or by the author of the Treatise of Human Nature, supposeth this. If this is true, their arguments are conclusive and unanswerable. But on the other hand, if it is not true, there is no shadow of argument left. Have these philosophers, then, given any solid proof of this hypothesis, upon which the whole weight of so strange a system rests? No. They have not so much as attempted to do it. But because ancient and modern philosophers have agreed in this opinion, they have taken it for granted. But let us become philosophers. Lay aside authority. We need not surely consult Aristotle or Locke to know whether pain be like the point of a sword. I have as clear a concept of extension, hardness, and motion as I have of the point of a sword and with some pains and practice I can form as clear a notion of the other sensations of touch as I have of pain. When I do so, and compare them together, it appears to me clear as daylight that the former are not of kin to the latter, nor resemble them in any one feature. They are as unlike, yea, as certainly and manifestly unlike, as pain is to the point of a sword. It may be true that those sensations first introduced the material world to our acquaintance. It may be true that it seldom or never appears without their company. But for all that, they are as unlike as the passion of anger is to those features of the countenance which attend it. So that, in the sentence those philosophers have passed against the material world, there is an error personae. Their proof touches not matter or any of its qualities but strikes directly against an idol of their own imagination, a material world made of ideas and sensations, which never had nor can have an existence. Secondly, the very existence of our conceptions of extension, figure, and motion, since they are neither ideas of sensation nor reflection, overturns the whole ideal system by which the material world hath been tried and condemned, so that there hath been likewise in this sentence an error juris. It is a very fine and just observation of Locke, that as no human art can create a single particle of matter, and the whole extent of our power over the material world consists in compounding, combining, and disjoining the matter made to our hands, so in the world of thought the materials are all made by nature and can only be variously combined and disjoined by us, so that it is impossible for reason or prejudice, true or false philosophy, to produce one simple notion or conception, which is not the work of nature, and the result of our constitution. The conception of extension, motion, and the other attributes of matter cannot be the effect of error or prejudice. It must be the work of nature and the power or faculty by which we acquire these conceptions must be something different from any power of the human mind that hath been explained, since it is neither sensation nor reflection. This I would therefore humbly propose as an experimentum crucis, by which the ideal system must stand or fall, and it brings the matter to a short issue. Extension, figure, motion, may any one or all of them be taken for the subject of this experiment. Either there are ideas of sensation, or there are not. If any one of them can be shown to be an idea of sensation, or to have the least resemblance to any sensation, I lay my hand upon my mouth and give up all pretense to reconcile reason to common sense in this matter, and must suffer the ideal skepticism to triumph. But if, on the other hand, they are not ideas of sensation, nor like to any sensation, then the ideal system is a rope of sand, and all the laboured arguments of the sceptical philosophy against a material world, 
and against the existence of everything but impressions and ideas, proceed upon a false hypothesis. If our philosophy concerning the mind be so lame with regard to the origin of our notions of the clearest, most simple, and most familiar objects of thought, and the powers from which they are derived, can we expect that it should be more perfect in the account it gives of the origin of our opinions and belief? We have seen already some instances of its imperfection in this respect, and perhaps that same nature which hath given us the power to conceive things altogether unlike to any of our sensations, or to any operation of our minds, hath likewise provided for our belief of them, by some part of our constitution hitherto not explained. Bishop Barclay hath proved beyond the possibility of reply that we cannot by reasoning infer the existence of matter from our sensations, and the author of the treatise of human nature hath proved no less clearly that we cannot by reasoning infer the existence of our own or other minds from our sensations. But are we to admit nothing but can be proved by reasoning? Then we must be skeptics indeed, and believe nothing at all. The author of the Treatise of Human Nature appears to me to be but a half-skeptic. He hath not followed his principles so far as they led him, but after having with unparalleled intrepidity and success combated vulgar prejudices, when he had but one blow to strike, his courage fails him. He fairly lays down his arms and yields himself a captive to the most common of all vulgar prejudices. I mean the belief of the existence of his own impressions and ideas. I beg, therefore, to have the honor of making an addition to the skeptical system, without which I conceive it cannot hang together. I affirm that the belief of the existence of impressions and ideas is as little supported by reason as that of the existence of mind and bodies. No man ever did or could offer any reason for this belief, Descartes took it for granted that he thought and had sensations and ideas. So have all his followers done. Even the hero of skepticism hath yielded this point. I crave leave to say, weakly and imprudently. I say so because I am persuaded that there is no principle of his philosophy that obliged him to make this concession. And what is there in impressions and ideas so formidable that this all-conquering philosophy after triumphing over every other existence, should pay homage to them. Besides, the concession is dangerous, for belief is of such a nature that if you leave any root it will spread, and you may more easily pull it up altogether than say, Hitherto shalt thou go, and no further. The existence of impressions and ideas I give up to thee, but see thou pretend to nothing more. A thorough and consistent skeptic will never, therefore, yield this point, and while he holds it, you can never oblige him to yield anything else. To such a skeptic I have nothing to say, but of the semi-skeptics I should beg leave to know why they believe the existence of their impressions and ideas. The true reason I take to be because they cannot help it, and the same reason will lead them to believe many other things. All reasoning must be from first principles, and for first principles no other reason can be given but this, that, by the constitution of our nature, we are under such a necessity of assenting to them. Such principles are parts of our constitution, no less than the power of thinking. Reason can neither make nor destroy them, nor can it do anything without them. It is like a telescope, which may help a man to see farther who hath eyes, but without eyes a telescope shows nothing at all. A mathematician cannot prove the truth of his axioms, nor can he prove anything, unless he takes them for granted. We cannot prove the existence of our minds, nor even of our thoughts and sensations. A historian or a witness can prove nothing, unless it is taken for granted that the memory and senses may be trusted. A natural philosopher can prove nothing, unless it is taken for granted that the course of nature is steady and uniform. How or when I got such first principles, upon which I build all my reasoning, I know not. For I had them before I can remember, but I am sure they are parts of my constitution, and that I cannot throw them off. 
that our thoughts and sensations must have a subject which we call ourself, is not therefore an opinion got by reasoning, but a natural principle. That our sensations of touch indicate something external, extended, figured, hard, or soft, is not a deduction of reason, but a natural principle. The belief of it, and the very conception of it, are equally parts of our constitution. If we are deceived in it, we are deceived by him that made us, and there is no remedy. I do not mean to affirm that the sensations of touch do from the very first suggest the same notions of body and its qualities which they do not when we are grown up. Perhaps nature is frugal in this, as in her other operations. The passion of love, with all its concomitant sentiments and desires, is naturally suggested by the perception of beauty in the other sex. Yet the same perception does not suggest the tender passion till a certain period of life. A blow given to an infant raises grief and lamentation, but when he grows up it as naturally stirs resentment and prompts him to resistance. Perhaps a child in the womb, or for some short period of its existence, is merely a sentient being, the faculties by which it perceives an external world, by which it reflects on its own thoughts and existence, and relation to other things, as well as its reasoning and moral faculties, unfold themselves by degree, so that it is inspired with the various principles of common sense, as with the passions of love and resentment, when it has occasion for them. Section 8. Of the Systems of Philosophers Concerning the Senses all the systems of philosophers about our senses and their objects have split upon this rock of not distinguishing properly sensations which can have no existence but when they are felt from the things suggested by them aristotle with as distinguishing a head as ever applied to the philosophical disquisitions confounds these two and makes every sensation to be the form without the matter of the thing perceived by it as the impression of a seal upon wax has the form of the seal, but nothing of the matter of it. So he conceived our sensations to be impressions upon the mind which bear the image, likeness, or form of the external thing perceived, without the matter of it. Color, sound, and smell, as well as extension, figure, and hardness, are, according to him, various forms of matter. Our sensations are the same forms imprinted on the mind, and perceived in its own intellect. It is evident from this that Aristotle made no distinction between primary and secondary qualities of bodies, although that distinction was made by Democritus, Epicurus, and others of the ancients. Descartes, Malebranc, and Locke revived the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, but they made the secondary qualities mere sensations, and the primary ones resemblances of our sensations. They maintained that color, sound, and heat are not anything in bodies, but sensations of the mind. At the same time they acknowledged some particular texture or modification of the body to be the cause or occasion of those sensations, but to this modification they gave no name. Whereas by the vulgar the names of color, heat and sound are but rarely applied to the sensations and most commonly to those unknown causes of them as hath been already explained the constitution of our nature leads us rather to attend to the things signified by the sensation than to the sensation itself and to give a name to the former rather than to the latter thus we see that with regard to secondary qualities these philosophers thought with the vulgar and with common sense. Their paradoxes were only an abuse of words, for when they maintain, as an important modern discovery, that there is no heat in fire, they mean no more than that the fire does not feel heat, which every one knew before. With regard to primary qualities, these philosophers erred more grossly. They indeed believed the existence of those qualities, but they did not at all attend to the sensations that suggest them which, having no names, have been as little considered as if they had no existence. They were aware that figure, extension, and hardness are perceived by means of sensations of touch, whence they rashly concluded 
that these sensations must be images and resemblances of figure, extension, and hardness. The received hypothesis of ideas naturally led them to this conclusion, and indeed cannot consist with any other, for according to that hypothesis, external things must be perceived by means of images of them in the mind, and what can those images of external things in the mind be but the sensations by which we perceive them? This, however, was to draw a conclusion from a hypothesis against fact. We need not have recourse to any hypothesis to know what our sensations are, or what they are like. By a proper degree of reflection and attention, we may understand them perfectly, and be as certain that they are not like any quality of body, as we can be that the toothache is not like a triangle. How a sensation should instantly make us conceive and believe the existence of an external thing altogether unlike to it, I do not pretend to know. And when I say that the one suggests the other, I mean not to explain the manner of their connection, but to express a fact which every one may be conscious of, namely, that by a law of our nature, such a conception and belief constantly and immediately follow the sensation. Bishop Berkeley gave new light to this subject by showing that the qualities of an inanimate thing, such as matter is conceived to be, cannot resemble any sensation that it is impossible to conceive anything like the sensations of our minds but the sensations of other minds. Every one that attends properly to his sensations must assent to this, yet it had escaped all the philosophers that came before Berkeley. It had escaped even the ingenious Locke, who had so much practiced reflection on the operations of his own mind. So difficult it is to attend properly even to our own feelings, they are so accustomed to pass through the mind unobserved, and instantly to make way for that which nature intended them to signify, that it is extremely difficult to stop and survey them. And when we think we have acquired this power, perhaps the mind still fluctuates between the sensation and its associated quality, so that they mix together, and present something to the imagination that is compound of both. Thus, in a globe or cylinder, whose opposite sides are quite unlike in color, if you turn it slowly, the colors are perfectly distinguishable, and their dissimilitude is manifest. But if it is turned fast, they lose their distinction, and seem to be of one and the same color. No succession can be more quick than that of tangible qualities to the sensations with which nature has associated them. But when one has once acquired the art of making them separate and distinct objects of thought, he will then clearly perceive that the maxim of Bishop Berkeley above mentioned is self-evident, and that the features of the face are not more unlike to a passion of the mind, which they indicate, than the sensations of touch are to the primary qualities of body. But let us observe what use the bishop made of this important discovery. Why, he concludes that we can have no conception of an inanimate substance, such as matter is conceived to be, or of any of its qualities, and that there is the strongest ground to believe that there is no existence in nature but minds, sensations, and ideas. If there is any other kind of existence, it must be what we neither have nor can have any conception of. But how does this follow? Why thus? we can have no conception of anything but what resembles some sensation or idea in our minds. But the sensations and ideas in our minds can resemble nothing but the sensations and ideas in other minds. Therefore the conclusion is evident. This argument, we see, leans upon two propositions. The last of them, the ingenious author, hath indeed made evident to all that understand his reasoning, and can attend to their own sensations. But the first proposition he never attempts to prove. It is taken from the doctrine of ideas, which hath been so universally received by philosophers that it was thought to need no proof. We may here again observe that this acute writer argues from a hypothesis against fact, and against the common sense of mankind. That we can have no conception of anything, unless there is some impression, sensation, or idea in our minds, which resemble it, is indeed an opinion which hath been very generally received among philosophers. 
but it is neither self-evident, nor hath it been clearly proved. And therefore it had been more reasonable to call in question this doctrine of philosophers than to discard the material world, and by that means expose philosophy to the ridicule of all men, who will not offer up common sense as a sacrifice to metaphysics. We ought, however, to do this justice both to the Bishop of Cloyne and to the author of the Treatise of Human Nature, to acknowledge that their conclusions are justly drawn from the doctrine of ideas, which has been so universally received. On the other hand, from the character of Bishop Berkeley, and of his predecessors Descartes, Locke, and Malebranche, we may venture to say that if they had seen all the consequences of this doctrine, as clearly as the author before mentioned did, they would have suspected it vehemently, and examined it more carefully than they appear to have done. The theory of ideas, like the Trojan horse, had a specious appearance, both of innocence and beauty. But if those philosophers had known that it carried in its belly death and destruction to all science and common sense, they would not have broken down their walls to give it admittance. That we have clear and distinct conceptions of extension, figure, motion, and other attributes of body which are neither sensations nor like any sensation, is a fact of which we may be as certain as that we have sensations. And after all, mankind have a fixed belief of an external material world, a belief which is neither got by reasoning nor education, and a belief which we cannot shake off, even when we seem to have strong arguments against it, and no shadow of argument for it, is likewise a fact for which we have all the evidence that the nature of the thing admits. These facts are phenomena of human nature, from which we may justly argue against any hypothesis, however generally received. But to argue from a hypothesis against facts is contrary to the rules of true philosophy. End of chapter 5. Recording by Stephen Reynolds, Durham, Connecticut. Chapter 6, Part 1 of An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Reynolds. An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. By Thomas Reed. Chapter 6, Part 1. Of Seeing. Section 1. The Excellence and Dignity of This Faculty. The advances made in the knowledge of optics in the last age, and in the present, and chiefly the discoveries of Sir Isaac Newton, do honor not to philosophy only, but to human nature. Such discoveries ought for ever to put to shame the ignoble attempts of our modern skeptics to depreciate the human understanding, and to dispirit men in the search of truth by representing the human faculties as fit for nothing but to lead us into absurdities and contradictions. Of the faculties called the five senses, sight is without doubt the noblest. The rays of light which minister to this sense, and, of which without it we could never have had the least conception, are the most wonderful and astonishing part of the inanimate creation. We must be satisfied of this if we consider their extreme minuteness, their inconceivable velocity, and regular variety of colors which they exhibit, the invariable laws according to which they are acted upon by other bodies, in their reflections, inflections, and refractions, without the least change of their original properties, and the facility with which they pervade bodies of great density, and of the closest texture, without resistance without crowding or disturbing one another, without giving the least sensible impulse to the lightest bodies. 
the structure of the eye and of all its appurtenances the admirable contrivances of nature for performing all its various external and internal motions and the variety in the eyes of different animals suited to their several natures and ways of life clearly demonstrate this organ to be a masterpiece of nature's work and he must be very ignorant of what hath been discovered about it or have a very strange cast of understanding who can seriously doubt whether or not the rays of light and the eye were made one for the other section two sight discovers almost nothing which the blind may not comprehend the reason of this notwithstanding what hath been said of the dignity and superior nature of this faculty it is worthy of our observation that there is very little of the knowledge acquired by sight that may not be communicated to a man born blind one who never saw the light may be learned and knowing in every science even in optics and may make discoveries in every branch of philosophy he may understand as much as another man not only of the order distances and motions of the heavenly bodies but of the nature of light and of the laws of the reflection and refraction of its rays he may understand distinctly how those laws produce the phenomena of the rainbow the prism the camera obscura and the magic lantern and all the powers of the microscope and telescope this is a fact sufficiently attested by experience in order to perceive the reason of it we must distinguish the appearance that objects make to the eye from the things suggested by that appearance and again in the visible appearance of objects we must distinguish the appearance of color from the appearance of extension figure and motion first then as to the visible appearance of the figure and motion and extension of bodies i conceive that a man born blind may have a distinct notion if not of the very things at least of something extremely like to them may not a blind man be made to conceive that a body moving directly from the eye or directly towards it may appear to be at rest and that the same motion may appear quicker or slower according as it is nearer to the eye or farther off more direct or more oblique may he not be made to conceive that a plane surface in a certain position may appear as a straight line and vary its visible figure as its position or the position of the eye is varied that a circle seen obliquely will appear an ellipse and a square, a rhombus, or an oblong rectangle. Dr. Saunderson understood the projection of the sphere and the common rules of perspective, and if he did, he must have understood all that I have mentioned. If there were any doubt of Dr. Saunderson's understanding these things, I could mention my having heard him say in conversation that he found great difficulty in understanding Dr. Haley's demonstration of that proposition that the angles made by the circles of the sphere are equal to the angles made by their representatives in the stereographic projection but said he when i laid aside that demonstration and considered the proposition in my own way i saw clearly that it must be true another gentleman of undoubted credit and judgment in these matters who had part in this conversation remembers it distinctly as to the appearance of color a blind man must be more at a loss because he hath no perception that resembles it yet he may by a kind of analogy in part supply this defect to those who see a scarlet color signifies an unknown quality in bodies that makes to the eye an appearance which they are well acquainted with and have often observed to a blind man it signifies an unknown quality that makes to the eye an appearance which he is acquainted with but he can conceive the eye to be variously affected by different colors as the nose is by different smells or the ear by different sounds thus he can conceive scarlet to differ from blue as the sound of a trumpet does from that of a drum or the smell of an orange differs from that of an apple it is impossible to know whether a scarlet color has the same appearance to me which it hath to another man and if the appearances of it to different persons differed as much as color does from sound they might never be able to discover this difference 
Hence it appears obvious that a blind man might talk long about colors distinctly and pertinently, and if you were to examine him in the dark about the nature, composition, and beauty of them, he might be able to answer, so as not to betray his defect. We have seen how far a blind man may go in the knowledge of the appearances which things make to the eye. As to the things which are suggested by them, or inferred from them, although he could never discover them of himself, yet he may understand them perfectly by the information of others. And everything of this kind that enters into our minds by the eye may enter into his by the ear. Thus, for instance, he could never, if left to the direction of his own faculties, have dreamed of any such thing as light. But he can be informed of everything we know about it. He can conceive as distinctly as we the minuteness and velocity of its rays, their various degrees of refrangibility and reflexibility, and all the magical powers and virtues of that wonderful element. He could never of himself have found out that there are such bodies as the sun, moon, and stars, but he may be informed of all the noble discoveries of astronomers about their motions and the laws of nature by which they are regulated. Thus it appears that there is very little knowledge got by the eye which may not be communicated by language to those who have no eyes. If we should suppose that it were as uncommon for men to see as it is to be born blind, would not the few who had this rare gift appear as prophets and inspired teachers to the many? We conceive inspiration to give a man no new faculty but to communicate to him in a new way and by extraordinary means what the faculties common to mankind can apprehend and what he can communicate to others by ordinary means on the supposition we have made sight would appear to the blind very similar to this for the few who had this gift could communicate the knowledge acquired by it to those who had it not they could not, indeed, convey to the blind any distinct notion of the manner in which they acquired this knowledge. A ball and socket would seem to a blind man, in this case, as improper an instrument for acquiring such a variety and extent of knowledge as a dream or a vision. The manner in which a man who sees discerns so many things by means of the eye is as unintelligible to the blind as the manner in which a man may be inspired with knowledge by the Almighty is to us. Ought the blind man, therefore, without examination, to treat all pretenses to the gift of seeing as imposture? Might he not, if he were candid and tractable, find reasonable evidence of the reality of this gift in others, and draw great advantages from it to himself? The distinction we have made between the visible appearances of the objects of sight, and things suggested by them, is necessary to give us a just notion of the intention of nature in giving us eyes. If we attend duly to the operation of our mind in the use of this faculty, we shall perceive that the visible appearance of objects is hardly ever regarded by us. It is not at all made an object of thought or reflection, but serves only as a sign to introduce to the mind something else, which may be distinctly conceived by those who never saw. Thus the visible appearance of things in my room varies almost every hour, according as the day is clear or cloudy, as the sun is in the east, or south, or west, and as my eye is in one part of the room or in another. But I never think of these variations otherwise than as signs of morning, noon, or night, of a clear or cloudy sky. A book or a chair has a different appearance to the eye in every different distance and position, yet we conceive it to be still the same, and, overlooking the appearance, we immediately conceive the real figure, distance, and position of the body, of which its visible or perspective appearance is a sign and indication. When I see a man at the distance of ten yards, and afterwards see him at the distance of a hundred yards, his visible appearance in its length, breadth, and all its linear proportions is ten times less in the last case than it is in the first. Yet I do not conceive him one inch diminished by this diminution of his visible figure. Nay, I do not in the least attend to this diminution, 
even when I draw from it the conclusion of his being at a greater distance. For such is the subtlety of the mind's operation in this case, that we draw the conclusion without perceiving that ever the premises entered into the mind. A thousand such instances might be produced in order to show that the visible appearances of objects are intended by nature only as signs or indications, and that the mind passes instantly to the things signified, without making the least reflection upon the sign, or even perceiving that there is any such thing. It is, in a way, somewhat similar that the sounds of a language, after it has become familiar, are overlooked, and we attend only to the things signified by them. It is, therefore, a just and important observation of the Bishop of Cloyne that the visible appearance of objects is a kind of language used by nature to inform us of their distance, magnitude, and figure. And this observation hath been very happily applied by that ingenious writer to the solution of some phenomena in optics, which had before perplexed the greatest masters in that science. The same observation is further improved by the judicious Dr. Smith in his optics, for explaining the apparent figure of the heavens, and the apparent distances and magnitude of objects seen with glasses, or by the naked eye. Avoiding as much as possible the repetition of what hath been said by these excellent writers, we shall avail ourselves of the distinction between the signs that nature useth in this visual language, and the things signified by them, and in what remains to be said of sight, shall first make some observations upon the signs. Section 3. Of the Visible Appearances of Objects. In this section we must speak of things which are never made the object of reflection, though almost every moment presented to the mind. Nature intended them only for signs, and in the whole course of life they are put to no other use. The mind has acquired a confirmed and inveterate habit of inattention to them, for they no sooner appear than, quick as lightning, the thing signified succeeds and engrosses all our regard. They have no name in language, and although we are conscious of them when they pass through the mind, yet their passage is so quick, and so familiar, that it is absolutely unheeded. Nor do they leave any footsteps of themselves, either in the memory or imagination. That this is the case with regard to the sensations of touch hath been shown in the last chapter, and it holds no less with regard to the visible appearances of objects. I cannot, therefore, entertain the hope of being intelligible to those readers who have not, by pains and practice, acquired the habit of distinguishing the appearance of objects to the eye from the judgment which we form by sight of their color, distance, magnitude, and figure. The only profession in life wherein it is necessary to make this distinction is that of painting. The painter hath occasion for an abstraction with regard to visible objects, somewhat similar to that which we here require, and this indeed is the most difficult part of his art. For it is evident that if he could fix in his imagination the visible appearance of objects without confounding it with the things signified by that appearance, it would be as easy for him to paint from the life, and to give every figure its proper shading and relief, and its prospective proportions, as it is to paint from a copy. Perspective, shading, giving relief, and coloring are nothing else but copying the appearance which things make to the eye. We may, therefore, borrow some light on the subject of visible appearance from this art. Let one look upon any familiar object, such as a book, at different distances and in different positions. Is he not able to affirm upon the testimony of his sight that it is the same book, the same object, whether seen at the distance of one foot or ten, whether in one position or another, that the color is the same, the dimensions the same, and the figure the same as far as the eye can judge? This surely must be acknowledged. The same individual object is presented to the mind, only placed at different distances and in different positions. Let me ask, in the next place, whether this object has the same appearance to the eye in those different distances. Infallibly it hath not. 
4. First, however, certain our judgment may be that the color is the same, it is as certain that it hath not the same appearance at different distances. There is a certain degradation of the color, and a certain confusion and indistinctness of the minute parts, which is the natural consequence of the removal of the object to a greater distance. Those that are not painters, or critics in painting, overlook this, and cannot easily be persuaded that the color of the same object hath a different appearance at the distance of one foot and of ten, in the shade and in the light. But the masters in painting know how, by the degradation of the color, and the confusion of the minute parts, figures which are upon the same canvas, and at the same distance from the eye, may be made to represent objects which are at the most unequal distances. They know how to make the objects appear to be of the same color, by making their pictures really of different colors, according to their distances or shades. Secondly, every one who is acquainted with the rules of perspective knows that the appearance of the figure of the book must vary in every different position. Yet if you ask a man who has no notion of perspective whether the figure of it does not appear to his eye to be the same in all its different positions, he can with a good conscience affirm that it does. He hath learned to make allowance for the variety of visible figures arising from the difference of positions, and to draw the proper conclusions from it. But he draws these conclusions so readily and habitually as to lose sight of the premises, and therefore, where he hath made the same conclusion, he conceives the visible appearance must have been the same. Thirdly, let us consider the apparent magnitude or dimensions of the book. Whether I view it at the distance of one foot or of ten feet, it seems to be about seven inches long, five broad and one thick. I can judge of these dimensions very nearly by the eye, and I judge them to be the same at both distances. But yet it is certain that at the distance of one foot its visible length and breadth is about ten times as great as at the distance of ten feet, and consequently its surface is about a hundred times as great. This great change of apparent magnitude is altogether overlooked, and every man is apt to imagine that it appears to the eye of the same size at both distances. Further, when I look at the book it seems plainly to have three dimensions, of length, breadth, and thickness. But it is certain that the visible appearance hath no more than two, and can be exactly represented upon a canvas which hath only length and breadth. In the last place, does not every man by sight perceive the distance of the book from his eye? Can he not affirm with certainty that in one case it is not above one foot distance, and in another it is ten? Nevertheless, it appears certain that distance from the eye is no immediate object of sight. There are certain things in the visible appearance which are signs of distance from the eye, and from which, as we shall afterwards show, we learn by experience to judge of that distance within certain limits. But it seems beyond doubt that a man born blind and suddenly made to see could form no judgment at first of the distance of the object which he saw. The young man couched by Cheselden thought at first that everything he saw touched his eye, and learned only by experience to judge of the distance of visible objects. I have entered into this long detail in order to show that the visible appearance of an object is extremely different from the notion of it which experience teaches us to form by sight, and to enable the reader to attend to the visible appearance of color, figure, and extension in visible things, which is no common object of thought, but must be carefully attended to by those who would enter into the philosophy of this sense, or would comprehend what shall be said upon it. To a man newly made to see, the visible appearance of objects would be the same as to us, but he would see nothing at all of their real dimensions, as we do. He could form no conjecture by means of his sight only, how many inches or feet they were in length, breadth, or thickness. He could perceive little or nothing of their real figure, nor could he discern that this was a cube, that a sphere, that this was a cone, and that a cylinder. His eye could not inform him that this object was near and that more remote. 
the habit of a man or of a woman which appeared to us of one uniform color variously folded and shaded would present to his eye neither fold nor shade but variety of color in a word his eyes though ever so perfect would at first give him almost no information of things without him they would indeed present the same appearance to him as they do to us and speak the same language but to him it is an unknown language and therefore he would attend only to the signs without knowing the signification of them whereas to us it is a language perfectly familiar and therefore we take no notice of the signs but attend only to the thing signified by them section four that color is a quality of bodies not a sensation of the mind by color all men who have not been tutored by modern philosophy understand not a sensation of the mind which can have no existence when it is not perceived but a quality or modification of bodies which continues to be the same whether it is seen or not the scarlet rose which is before me is still a scarlet rose when i shut my eyes and was so at midnight when no eye saw it the color remains when the appearance ceases it remains the same when the appearance changes for when i view this scarlet rose through a pair of green spectacles the appearance is changed but i do not conceive the color of the rose changed to a person in the jaundice it is still another appearance but he is easily convinced that the change is in his eye and not in the color of the object every different degree of light makes it have a different appearance and total darkness takes away all appearance but makes not the least change in the color of the body we may by a variety of optical experiments change the appearance or figure and magnitude in a body as well as that of color we may make one body appear to be ten but all men believe that as a multiplying glass does not really produce ten guineas out of one nor a microscope turn a guinea into a ten-pound piece so neither does a colored glass change the real color of the object seen through it when it changes the appearance of that color the common language of mankind shows evidently that we ought to distinguish between the color of a body which is conceived to be a fixed and permanent quality in that body and the appearance of that color to the eye which may be varied a thousand ways by a variation of the light of the medium or of the eye itself the permanent color of the body is the cause which by the mediation of various kinds or degrees of light and of various transparent bodies interposed produces all this variety of appearances when a colored body is presented there is a certain apparition to the eye or to the mind which we have called the appearance of color mr locke calls it an idea and indeed it may be called so with the greatest propriety this idea can have no existence but when it is perceived it is a kind of thought and can only be the act of a percipient or thinking being by the constitution of our nature we are led to conceive this idea as a sign of something external and are impatient till we learn its meaning a thousand experiments for this purpose are made every day by children even before they come to the use of reason they look at things they handle them they put them in various positions at different distances and in different lights the ideas of sight by these means come to be associated with and readily to suggest things external and altogether unlike them in particular that idea which we have called the appearance of color suggests the conception and belief of some unknown quality in the body which occasions the idea and it is to this quality and not to the idea that we give the name of color the various colors although in their nature equally unknown are easily distinguished when we think or speak of them by being associated with the ideas which they excite in like manner gravity magnetism and electricity although all unknown qualities are distinguished by their different effects as we grow up the mind acquires a habit of passing so rapidly from the ideas of sight to the external things suggested by them that the ideas are not in the least attended to nor have they names given them in common language 
when we think or speak of any particular color however simple the notion may seem to be which is presented to the imagination it is really in some sort compounded it involves an unknown cause and an unknown effect the name of color belongs indeed to the cause only and not to the effect but as the cause is unknown we can form no distinct conception of it but by its relation to the known effect and therefore both go together in the imagination and are so closely united that they are mistaken for one simple object of thought when i would conceive those colors of bodies which we call scarlet and blue if i conceived them only as unknown qualities i could perceive no distinction between the one and the other i must therefore for the sake of distinction join to each of them in my imagination some effect or some relation that is peculiar and the most obvious distinction is the appearance which one and the other makes to the eye hence the appearance is in the imagination so closely united with the quality called a scarlet color that they are apt to be mistaken for one and the same thing although they are in reality so different and so unlike that one is an idea in the mind and the other is a quality of the body I conclude, then, that color is not a sensation, but a secondary quality of bodies, in the sense we have already explained, that it is a certain power or virtue in bodies that in fair daylight exhibits to the eye an appearance which is very familiar to us, although it hath no name. Color differs from other secondary qualities in this, that whereas the name of the quality is sometimes given to the sensation which indicates it, and is occasioned by it, we never, as far as I can judge, give the name of color to the sensation, but to the quality only. Perhaps the reason of this may be that the appearance of the same color are so various and changeable, according to the different modifications of the light, of the medium, and of the eye, that language could not afford names for them. And, indeed, they are so little interesting that they are never attended to, but serve only as signs to introduce the things signified by them. Nor ought it to appear incredible that appearance so frequent and so familiar should have no names, nor be made objects of thought, since we have before shown that this is true of many sensations of touch, which are no less frequent nor less familiar. Section 5. An Inference from the Preceding from what hath been said about color we may infer two things the first is that one of the most remarkable paradoxes of modern philosophy which hath been universally esteemed as a great discovery is in reality when examined to the bottom nothing else but an abuse of words the paradox i mean is that color is not a quality of bodies but only an idea in the mind we have shown that the word color as used by the vulgar cannot signify an idea in the mind, but a permanent quality of body. We have shown that there is really a permanent quality of body, to which the common use of this word exactly agrees. Can any stronger proof be desired that this quality is that to which the vulgar give the name of color? If it should be said that this quality to which we give the name of color is unknown to the vulgar, and therefore can have no name among them, I answer, it is indeed known only by its effects, that is, by its exciting a certain idea in us. But are there not numberless qualities of bodies which are known only by their effects, to which notwithstanding we find it necessary to give names? Medicine alone might furnish us with a hundred instances of this kind. Do not the words astringent, narcotic, epispastic, caustic, and innumerable others signify qualities of bodies which are known only by their effects upon animal bodies why then should not the vulgar give a name to a quality whose effects are every moment perceived by their eyes we have all the reason therefore that the nature of the thing admits to think that the vulgar apply the name of color to that quality of bodies which excites in us what the philosophers call the idea of color and that there is such a quality in bodies, all philosophers allow, who allow that there is any such thing as body. Philosophers have thought fit to leave that quality of bodies, which the vulgar call color, without a name, 
and to give the name of color to the idea or appearance to which, as we have shown, the vulgar give no name, because they never make it an object of thought or reflection. Hence it appears that when philosophers affirm that color is not in bodies, but in the mind, and the vulgar affirm that color is not in the mind, but is a quality of bodies, there is no difference between them about things, but only about the meaning of a word. The vulgar have undoubted right to give names to things which they are daily conversant about, and philosophers seem justly chargeable with an abuse of language when they change the meaning of a common word without giving warning. If it is a good rule to think with philosophers and speak with the vulgar, it must be right to speak with the vulgar when we think with them, and not to shock them by philosophical paradoxes, which, when put into common language, express only the common sense of mankind. If you ask a man, that is no philosopher, what color is, or what makes one body appear white, another scarlet, he cannot tell. He leaves that inquiry to philosophers, and can embrace any hypothesis about it except that our modern philosophers, who affirm that color is not in body, but only in the mind. Nothing appears more shocking to his apprehension than that visible objects should have no color, and that color should be in that which he conceives to be invisible. Yet this strange paradox is not only universally received, but considered as one of the noblest discoveries of modern philosophy. The ingenious Addison, in The Spectator, number 413, speaks thus of it. I have here supposed that my reader is acquainted with the great modern discovery which is at present universally acknowledged by all the inquirers into natural philosophy, namely, that light and colors, as apprehended by the imagination, are only ideas in the mind, and not qualities that have any existence in matter. As this is a truth which has been proved incontestably by many modern philosophers, and is indeed one of the finest speculations in that science, if the English reader would see the notion explained at large, he may find it in the eighth chapter of the second book of Locke's Essay on Human Understanding. Mr. Locke and Mr. Addison are writers who have deserved so well of mankind that one must feel some uneasiness in differing from them, and would wish to ascribe all the merit that is due to a discovery upon which they put so high a value. And indeed it is just to acknowledge that Locke and other modern philosophers on the subject of secondary qualities have the merit of distinguishing more accurately than those that went before them between the sensations of the mind and that constitution or quality of bodies which gives occasion to the sensation. They have shown clearly that these two things are not only distinct, but altogether unlike, that there is no similitude between the effluvia of an odorous body and the sensation of smell, or between the vibrations of a sounding body and the sensation of sound, that there can be no resemblance between the feeling of heat and the constitution of the heated body which occasions it, or between the appearance which a colored body makes to the eye and the texture of the body which causes that appearance. Nor was the merit small of distinguishing these things accurately, because, however different and unlike in their nature, they have been always associated in the imagination, as to coalesce, as it were, into one two-faced form, which, from its amphibious nature, could not justly be appropriated, either to body or mind, and until it was properly distinguished into its different constituent parts, it was impossible to assign to either their just shares in it. None of the ancient philosophers had made this distinction. The followers of Democritus and Epicurus conceived the forms of heat and sound and color to be in the mind only, and that our senses fallaciously represented them as being in bodies, the peripatetics imagined that those forms are really in bodies, and that the images of them are conveyed to the mind by our senses. The one system made the senses naturally fallacious and deceitful. The other made the qualities of body to resemble the sensations of the mind. Nor was it possible to find a third without making the distinction we have mentioned. 
by which indeed the errors of both these ancient systems are avoided, and we are not left under the hard necessity of believing either, on the one hand, that our sensations are like the qualities of body, or, on the other, that God hath given us one faculty to deceive us, and another to detect the cheat. We desire, therefore, with pleasure to do justice to the doctrine of Locke, and other modern philosophers, with regard to color and other secondary qualities, and to ascribe to it its due merit, while we beg leave to censure the language in which they have expressed their doctrine. When they had explained and established the distinction between the appearance which color makes to the eye, and the modification of the colored body, which by the laws of nature causes that appearance, the question was whether to give the name of color to the cause or to the effect. By giving it as they have done to the effect, they set philosophy apparently in opposition to common sense, and expose it to the ridicule of the vulgar. But had they given the name color to the cause, as they ought to have done, they must then have affirmed, with the vulgar, that color is a quality of bodies, and that there is neither color nor anything like it in the mind. Their language, as well as their sentiments, would have been perfectly agreeable to the common apprehensions of mankind, and true philosophy would have joined hands with common sense. As Locke was no enemy to common sense, it may be presumed that in this instance, as in some others, he was seduced by some received hypothesis, and that this was actually the case will appear in the following section. Section 6 that none of our sensations are resemblances of any of the qualities of bodies. A second inference is, that although color is really a quality of body, yet it is not represented to the mind by an idea or sensation that resembles it. On the contrary, it is suggested by an idea which does not in the least resemble it. And this inference is applicable not to color only, but to all the qualities of body which we have examined. It deserves to be remarked that in the analysis we have hitherto given of the operations of the five senses, and of the qualities of bodies discovered by them, no instance hath occurred either of any sensation which resembles any quality of body, or of any quality of body whose image or resemblance is conveyed to the mind by means of the sense. There is no phenomenon in nature more unaccountable than the intercourse that is carried on between the mind and the external world. There is no phenomenon which philosophical spirits have shown greater avidity to pry into and to resolve. It is agreed by all that this intercourse is carried on by means of the senses, and this satisfies the vulgar curiosity, but not the philosophic. Philosophers must have some system, some hypothesis, that shows the manner in which our senses make us acquainted with external things. All the fertility of human invention seems to have produced only one hypothesis for this purpose, which therefore hath been universally received, and that is, that the mind, like a mirror, receives the images of things from without, by means of the senses, so that their use must be to convey these images to, into the mind. Whether to these images of external things in the mind we give the name of sensible forms or sensible species, with the peripatetics or the name of ideas of sensations with Locke, or whether with later philosophers we distinguish sensations which are immediately conveyed by the sense from ideas of sensations which are faint copies of our sensations retained in the memory and imagination, these are only differences about words. The hypothesis I have mentioned is common to all these different systems. The necessary and allowed consequence of this hypothesis is that no material thing, nor any quality of material things, can be conceived by us or made an object of thought until its image is conveyed to the mind by means of the senses. We shall examine this hypothesis particularly afterwards, and at this time only observe that, in consequence of it, one would naturally expect that to every quality and attribute of body, we know or can conceive, there should be a sensation corresponding, which is the image and resemblance of that quality, and that the sensations which have no similitude or resemblance to the body, 
or to any of its qualities, should give us no conception of a material world, or of anything belonging to it. These things might be expected as the natural consequence of the hypothesis we have mentioned. Now, we have considered in this and the preceding chapters extension, figure, solidity, motion, hardness, roughness, as well as color, heat and cold, sound, taste, and smell. We have endeavored to show that our nature and constitution lead us to conceive these as qualities of body, as all mankind have always conceived them to be. We have likewise examined with great attention the various sensations we have by means of the five senses, and are not able to find among them all one single image of body or of any of its qualities. From whence, then, come these images of body and of its qualities into the mind? Let philosophers resolve this question. All I can say is that they come not by the senses. I am sure that by proper attention and care I may know my sensations, and be able to affirm with certainty what they resemble, and what they do not resemble. I have examined them one by one, and compared them with matter and its qualities, and I cannot find one of them that confesses a resembling feature. A truth so evident as this, that our sensations are not images of matter, or of any of its qualities, ought not to yield to a hypothesis such as that above mentioned, however ancient, or however universally received by philosophers. Nor can there be any amicable union between the two, this will appear by some reflections upon the spirit of the ancient and modern philosophy concerning sensation. During the reign of the peripatetic philosophy, our sensations were not minutely or accurately examined. The attention of philosophers, as well as of the vulgar, was turned to the things signified by them. Therefore, in consequence of the common hypothesis, it was taken for granted that all the sensations we have from external things are the forms or images of these external things. And thus the truth we have mentioned yielded entirely to the hypothesis, and was altogether suppressed by it. Descartes gave a noble example of turning our attention inward, and scrutinizing our sensations, and this example hath been worthily followed by modern philosophers, particularly by Malebranche, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. The effect of this scrutiny hath been a gradual discovery of the truth above mentioned, to wit, the dissimilitude between the sensations of our minds, and the qualities or attributes of an insentient inert substance, such as we conceive matter to be. But this valuable and useful discovery in its different stages hath been still unhappily united to the ancient hypothesis, and from this inauspicious match of opinions, so unfriendly and discordant in their natures, have arisen these monsters of paradox and scepticism, with which the modern philosophy is too justly chargeable. Locke saw clearly, and proved incontestably, that the sensations we have by taste, smell, and hearing, as well as the sensations of color, heat, and cold, are not resemblances of anything in bodies and in this he agrees with Descartes and Malebranche. Joining these opinions with the hypothesis, it follows necessarily that three senses of the five are cut off from giving us any intelligence of the material world, as being altogether inept for that office. Smell and taste, and sound as well as color and heat, can have no more relation to body than anger or gratitude, nor ought the former to be called qualities of body, whether primary or secondary, any more than the latter. For it was natural and obvious to argue thus from that hypothesis. If heat and color and sound are real qualities of body and sensations, by which we perceive them, must be resemblances of those qualities. But the sensations are not resemblances, therefore those are not real qualities of body. We see, then, that Locke, having found that the ideas of secondary qualities are no resemblances, was compelled, by a hypothesis common to all philosophers, to deny that they are real qualities of body. It is more difficult to assign a reason why, after this, he should call them secondary qualities. 
for this name, if I mistake not, was of his invention. Surely he did not mean that they were secondary qualities of the mind, and I do not see with what propriety, or even by what tolerable license, he could call them secondary qualities of body, after finding that they were no qualities of body at all. In this he seems to have sacrificed to common sense, and to have been led by her authority, even in opposition to his hypothesis. The same sovereign mistress of our opinions that led this philosopher to call those things secondary qualities of body, which according to his principles and reasonings were no qualities of body at all, hath led not the vulgar of all ages only, but philosophers also, and even the disciples of Locke, to believe them to be real qualities of body. She hath led them to investigate by experiments the nature of color, and sound, and heat in bodies. Nor hath this investigation been fruitless, as it must have been, if there had been no such thing in bodies. On the contrary, it hath produced very noble and useful discoveries, which make very considerable part of natural philosophy. If then natural philosophy be not a dream, there is something in bodies which we call color, and heat, and sound. And if this be so, the hypothesis from which the contrary is concluded must be false, for the argument leading to a false conclusion recoils against the hypothesis from which it was drawn, and thus directs its force backwards. If the qualities of body were known to us only by sensations that resemble them, then color and sound and heat could be no qualities of body. But these are real qualities of body, and therefore the qualities of body are not known only by means of sensations that resemble them. But to proceed. What Locke had proved with regard to the sensations we have by smell, taste, and hearing, Bishop Berkeley proved no less unanswerably with regard to all our other sensations, to wit that none of them can in the least resemble the qualities of a lifeless and insentient being, such as matter is conceived to be. Mr. Hume hath confirmed this by his authority and reasoning. This opinion surely looks with a very malign aspect upon the old hypothesis. Yet that hypothesis hath still been retained, and conjoined with it. And what a brood of monsters had this produced! The first born of this union, and perhaps the most harmless, was that the secondary qualities of body were mere sensations of the mind. To pass by Malebranche's notion of seeing all things in the ideas of the divine mind, as a foreigner never naturalized in this island, the next was Berkeley's system, that extension and figure and hardness and motion, that land and sea and houses and our own bodies, as well as those of our wives and children and friends, are nothing but ideas of the mind, and that there is nothing existing in nature but minds and ideas. The progeny that followed is still more frightful, so that it is surprising that one can be found who had the courage to act the midwife, to rear it up, and to usher it into the world. No causes nor effects, no substances, material or spiritual, no evidence, even in mathematical demonstration, no liberty nor active power, nothing existing in nature but impressions and ideas, following each other without time, place, or subject. Surely no age ever produced such a system of opinions justly deduced with great acuteness, perspicuity, and elegance, from a principle universally received. The hypothesis we have mentioned is the father of them all. The dissimilitude of our sensations and feelings to external things is the innocent mother of most of them. As it happens sometimes in arithmetical operation that two errors balance one another, so that the conclusion is little or nothing affected by them, but when one of them is corrected and the other left, we are led farther from the truth than by both together. So it seems to have happened in the peripatetic philosophy of sensation compared with the modern. The peripatetics adopted two errors, but the last served as a corrective to the first, and rendered it mild and gentle, so that their system had no tendency to skepticism. The moderns have retained the first of those errors, but have gradually detected and corrected the last. 
The consequence hath been that the light we have struck out hath created darkness, and skepticism hath advanced hand in hand with knowledge, spreading its melancholy gloom first over the material world, and last over the whole face of nature. Such a phenomenon as this is apt to stagger even the lovers of light and knowledge while its cause is latent. But when that is detected, it may give hopes that this darkness shall not be everlasting, but that it shall be succeeded by a more permanent light. Section 8 Of Visible Figure and Extension Although there is no resemblance, nor, as far as we know, any necessary connection, between that quality in a body which we call its color, and the appearance which that color makes to the eye, it is quite otherwise with regard to its figure and magnitude. There is certainly a resemblance, and a necessary connection, between the visible figure and magnitude of a body, and its real figure and magnitude. No man can give a reason why a scarlet color affects the eye in the manner it does. No man can be sure that it affects his eye in the same manner as it affects the eye of another, and that it has the same appearance to him as it has to another man. But we can assign a reason why a circle, placed obliquely to the eye, should appear in the form of an ellipse. The visible figure, magnitude, and position may, by mathematical reasoning, be deduced from the real, and it may be demonstrated that every eye that sees distinctly and perfectly must in the same situation see it under this form and no other. Nay, we may venture to affirm that a man born blind, if he were instructed in mathematics, would be able to determine the visible figure of a body when its real figure, distance, and position are given. Dr. Saunderson understood the projection of the sphere and perspective. Now, I require no more knowledge in a blind man, in order to his being able to determine the visible figure of bodies, than that he can project the outline of a given body upon the surface of a hollow sphere, whose center is in the eye. This projection is the visible figure he wants, for it is the same figure with that which is projected upon the tunica retina in vision. A blind man can conceive lines drawn from every point of the object to the center of the eye, making angles. He can conceive that the length of the object will appear greater, or less, in proportion to the angle which it subtends at the eye, and that, in like manner, the breadth and, in general, the distance of any one point of the object from any other point, will appear greater or less in proportion to the angles which those distances subtend he can easily be made to conceive that the visible appearance has no thickness any more than a projection of the sphere or a perspective draught. He may be informed that the eye, until it is aided by experience, does not represent one object as nearer or more remote than another. Indeed, he would probably conjecture this of himself, and be apt to think that the rays of light must make the same impression upon the eye, whether they come from a greater or less distance. These are all the principles which we suppose our blind mathematician to have, and these he may certainly acquire by information and reflection. It is no less certain that from these principles, having given the real figure and magnitude of a body, and its position and distance with regard to the eye, he can find out its visible figure and magnitude. He can demonstrate, in general, from these principles that the visible figure of all bodies will be the same with that of their projection upon the surface of a hollow sphere when the eye is placed in the center. And he can demonstrate that their visible magnitude will be greater or less according as their projection occupies a greater or less part of the surface of this sphere. To set this matter in another light, let us distinguish betwixt the position of objects with regard to the eye, and their distance from it. Objects that lie in the same right line drawn from the center of the eye have the same position, however different their distances from the eye may be. But objects which lie in different right lines drawn from the eye's center have a different position, and this difference of position is greater or less in proportion to the angle made at the eye by the right lines mentioned. Having thus defined what we mean by the position of objects with regard to the eye, 
It is evident that as the real figure of a body consists in the situation of its several parts with regard to one another, so its visible figure consists in the position of its several parts with regard to the eye. And as he that hath a distinct conception of the situation of the parts of the body with regard to one another must have a distinct conception of its real figure, so he that conceives distinctly the position of its several parts with regard to the eye must have a distinct conception of its visible figure. Now there is nothing surely to hinder a blind man from conceiving the position of the several parts of a body with regard to the eye any more than from conceiving their situation with regard to one another, and therefore I conclude that a blind man may attain a distinct conception of the visible figure of bodies. Although we think the arguments that have been offered are sufficient to prove that a blind man may conceive the visible extension and figure of bodies, yet in order to remove some prejudices against this truth, it will be of use to compare the notion which a blind mathematician might form to himself of visible figure with that which is presented to the eye in vision, and to observe wherein they differ. First, visible figure is never presented to the eye but in conjunction with color, and although there be no connection between them from the nature of things, yet having so invariably kept company together, we are hardly able to disjoin them even in our imagination. What mightily increases this difficulty is that we have never been accustomed to make visible figure an object of thought. It is only used as a sign and having served this purpose, passes away without leaving a trace behind. The drawer or designer, whose business it is to hunt this fugitive form, and to take a copy of it, finds how difficult his task is, after many years' labor and practice. Happy if at last he can acquire the art of arresting it in his imagination until he can delineate it for then it is evident that he must be able to draw as accurately from the life as from a copy. But how few of the professed masters of designing are ever able to arrive at this degree of perfection? It is no wonder, then, that we should find so great difficulty in conceiving this form apart from its constant associate, when it is so difficult to conceive it at all. But our blind man's notion of visible figure will not be associated with color, of which he hath no conception, but it will perhaps be associated with hardness or smoothness, with which he is acquainted by touch. These different associations are apt to impose upon us and to make things seem different, which in reality are the same. Secondly, the blind man forms the notion of visible figure to himself by thought and by mathematical reasoning from principles, whereas the man that sees has it presented to his eye at once, without any labor, without any reasoning, by a kind of inspiration. A man may form to himself the notion of a parabola or a cycloid from the mathematical definition of those figures, although he had never seen them drawn or delineated. Another who knows nothing of the mathematical definition of the figures may see them delineated on paper, or feel them cut out on wood. Each may have a distinct conception of the figures, one by mathematical reasoning, the other by sense. Now, the blind man forms his notion of visible figure in the same manner as the first of these formed his notion of a parabola or a cycloid, which he never saw. Third, visible figure leads the man that sees directly to the conception of the real figure of which it is a sign, but the blind man's thoughts move in a contrary direction for he must first know the real figure, distance, and situation of the body, and from thence he slowly traces out the visible figure by mathematical reasoning. Nor does his nature lead him to conceive this visible figure as a sign. It is a creature of his own reason and imagination. End of chapter 6, part 1 Recording by Stephen Reynolds Durham, Connecticut